Okay, we're going to call the meeting to order. Good evening. I'm Councillor Terry Towner, and on behalf of City Council, I would like to welcome everyone to this public hearing this evening. Mayor Stewart is currently out of the country on city business, so and I'm acting mayor at the moment, so I'll be running the meeting tonight. We're having a public hearing into the bylaws that will be introduced to you in a moment by our city clerk. Council for the City of Coquitlam has given first reading to these bylaws and directed that this public hearing be held. Staff from the City's Planning and Development Department will present a summary of each of the proposed bylaws. The floor will then be open to anyone in attendance who wishes to present his or her views on the proposed bylaw. Those that have pre-registered will be given first opportunity to speak. I stress to all of you that this is a public hearing. It's an opportunity for anyone who has a view on the proposed bylaw to make that view known to council members. Council members are here with an open mind and you're here to listen to your input. No one has prejudged the outcome of these applications. I also want to emphasize that tonight is not a question and answer period. It is not an opportunity to debate the merits of the proposed bylaws with either council members, staff, or those in the audience who may be opposed to your particular view. I ask that you restrict your comments to the proposed bylaws and be as brief and concise as possible. We are asking speakers to respect a five minute time limit in order that everyone who wishes to speak is able to do so. Speakers are permitted to speak more than once only if they are providing new or additional information. When you come up to speak, um, there's a podium there and that black thing across the back is the microphone. Right in front of you is a little box with lights. Once the red light goes on, that's the five minute mark. And if the red light comes on, I will interrupt you and ask you to, to wrap up your comments. I ask that the audience be respectful of each speaker and allow that speaker to make his or her point without interruption. Please refrain, refrain from clapping, cheering, or booing during any presentation made this evening. As chair of this hearing, I, I hope I won't need to, but I do reserve the right to conclude any presentation that doesn't relate to the bylaw, becomes abusive, or becomes repetitive of views that the speaker has already made known to council members. Please note, if you wish to provide a written submission to be included in the record of tonight's meeting, you must hand in that submission to the clerk prior to the adjournment of the related item on the agenda. Please also note, Council may not receive any additional information, written or verbal, after the adjournment of the public hearing and prior to consideration of the respective bylaws at the next Council meeting. Immediately following the adjournment of the public hearing tonight, a regular council meeting will convene in order that council may give consideration to the items on the public hearing agenda. However, if during the public hearing, council requests further information related to an item, consideration of that item will be deferred pending receipt of the requested information. I will now call on Mr. Gilbert to introduce the bylaws on tonight's agenda and planning and development staff to make a presentation on the first item. Thank you, Madam Chair. First item this evening is an application for a text amendment to the City of Coquitlam Zoning Bylaw Number 3000 in order to revise the regulations pertaining to recreational and commercial vehicle parking in residential zones. This is Bylaw Number 4741. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of Council. Uh, my name is Jeremy Keating. I'm a planner with the Development Planning Division here at the City. Uh, tonight I'm going to be presenting the proposed amendments for the zoning bylaw with respect to the parking and storage of recreational and commercial vehicles in residential areas. This is bylaw number 4741, 2017. So throughout this presentation and as you consider the bylaw this evening, um, there are a number of relevant zones uh, at play here. Uh, with the exception of the first two points uh, of the recommendation section that we'll get to in a moment, uh, this amendment pertains to these zones and these zones only. Uh, this is all the one-family zones in our city, so RS1 through RS11. Uh, RTM1, so that's our uh, street-oriented uh, village home uh, zone. RT1, RT2, RT3, RM1, and RMH1. So these zones currently contain regulations pertaining to recreational vehicles, which is why they're included in this amendment. 
Our other recreational or uh, residential zones, excuse me, RM2 uh, through 6, do not currently contain regulations around uh, recreational vehicles, and so we're omitted from this amendment. Uh, so the proposed uh, zoning bylaw amendment before you would facilitate a number of changes to the regulations pertaining to parking and storage of recreational commercial vehicles in certain residential zones as I've outlined, including vehicle weight, height, length, ownership, and some certain neighbor, neighbor adjacency issues. So uh, because it's kind of a, a bit of a complex bylaw, staff has anticipated that council may want to uh, vote on certain items independently of others. Uh, therefore, we've broken the bylaw down into a number of recommendations that if council should wish to do so, you can vote on independently of one another. So diving into our recommendations, staff recommend that council give uh, second, third, and fourth and final reading to zoning bylaw amendment 4741-2017 as follows. Add a definition of contractor's equipment to the zoning bylaw. Remove the 4,500 kilogram gross vehicle weight limit from recreational vehicles and passenger vehicles parked on any lot. Limit, the proper, limit a property to two of any combination of recreational vehicles or boat trailers unless completely enclosed within a building or underground in an RM1 zone. Restrict the height of recreational and commercial vehicles to 3.7 meters unless otherwise enclosed within a building or underground in an RM1 zone. Require visual screening of at least 1.8 meters uh, of recreational and commercial vehicles parked within an interior or exterior side lot, a uh, side yard rather. Number six, permit recreational vehicles, uh, commercial vehicles longer than the existing 7.6 meter limit uh, on lots with longer driveways or parking pads. Seven, restrict the ownership of recreational and commercial vehicles parked or stored on the residential in the residential zones outlined previously to a, an owner or an occupant of that property. And finally, number eight, implement a number of housekeeping items uh, that'll make the zoning by a little clearer and easier to administrate. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Asmussen. Thank you very much. Through to staff, a, a question on the um, motorhomes being parked on a driveway. Uh, could they be used as a rental for people to live in while they're parked, they're not being used, or could it be used as an Airbnb? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Asmundson, uh, no, it could not be used as a, as a living unit while it's parked in a residential lot. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Okay, we have one registered speaker for this item, Julia Hamilton. And Julia's address is 1760 Woodvale Avenue in Coquilla. Good evening. Good evening. Um, you can come with me. All right. Um, I just uh, wanted to uh, thank uh, the uh, members of council and then the mayor who didn't come today who has visited our property in the past to see the impact of a large trailer has had on our property. So this is our neighbor's uh, trailer right there. Um, as you can see by the photo in here, our house is on the right hand side, his house is on the left hand side. Our house is approximately 34 feet long and the trailer, this trailer is in excess of 36 feet, is longer than the length of our house. Um, that trailer, um, when our neighbor built his property, he uh, raised the uh, property uh, so it was level. So in uh, doing so, we needed to build a retaining wall and a fence. Uh, the retaining wall and fence comes to a height of 10 feet. Um, and then with his trailer, which was taller than the eaves and uh, the, the middle of our house, those of you that came to our house to see it, um, basically in, in essence blocked the uh, light that we had from our basement windows as well as my son's uh, bedroom. So this was the view from my son's window with that trailer in um, being there. Um, the white uh, the white part of the top of the trailer is kind of masked, but basically that's what he woke up and saw. That was our attempt to try to cover up or mitigate the uh, view of the uh, trailer that was seen by that. Um, he has since removed the trailer and uh, replaced it with this trailer. So this is the view from a couple of days ago. Um, this trailer is uh, approximately the same height as our eaves, although it doesn't appear from in this photo right here, it does basically is uh, the height of our um, eaves. 
So this trailer is approximately, I don't know, about 24 uh, feet. It complies within the bylaw as it is written now. Now, if we were to go back to this photo here, obviously our driveway and his driveway would be able to fall within uh, the proposed changes to allow a trailer to be in excess of the uh, 26 feet or whatever the bylaw is right now. And that would put our situation back to the original thing where our son would be looking at uh, this view from his bedroom and, and basically not having any light from his bedroom. The other part of the bylaw that we're against is the fact that he would then need to either raise his fence. Right now it's about a four and a half foot fence. He would have to raise that to a six foot fence, which in an essence would build the 10 foot wall that we have there to uh, be now 11 and a half feet high, which would seriously impact um, the view that we have as well as the light. I just wanted to go back to you, uh, just if, if you were to imagine uh, that 36 foot trailer and the 20 foot height. So 36 feet by 20, nobody really wants to have that on the side of their property. Now because the property is elevated, I believe that puts um, um, our situation a little bit different. However, I do not believe that we're unique in our situation because Coquitlam is hilly. Uh, I've read lots of stories where uh, people have leveled out their property and we don't know if this is a situation that would uh, perhaps uh, put other people at um, the same situation we are. So I'm asking council to either reject the bylaw as it's written or to amend the bylaw so that we don't live in a situation like that as it takes away from our enjoyment of our property. It perhaps leads us to ability to not be able to sell our property because nobody would want to look out their window and see that view that we have um, right there. I don't know if I've said everything. Did I mention the thing about the trees? I can't Oh, the fence. Okay, the fence. Back to the fence. So the trees. So, uh, sorry, I, my son has hockey and we were up since 4.30. Um, <clears throat> so the, the fence, so, uh, yeah, so I raised the fence. So, yeah, I think I've said everything I want to say. Sorry. I don't know if it makes sense anymore. <laughs> okay, so thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, Councillor Hodge. For a, for a resident. What do you mean? Question for actually, I'd like to, oh, you question were. for staff. But one of her one of her pictures raised a question that I okay. that I had for staff. No, that's okay. That's okay. It's, it's I'm, I'm learning a lot about mobile homes and trailers and stuff uh, through this process. Um, to staff, the in, in the bylaw goes through. I'm looking out at this this picture here. Um, that height would not be allowed, or would that help, how, height be allowed? But only within a enclosed building. I just wasn't clear how this this uh, mobile home would conform. I, mean, I, I recognize you don't have all the heights and things with you, but I'm just sort of wondering. It said you can you can go up to uh, 3.7 meters, providing it's enclosed, and that would mean a another structure on the property, or do, or would one of these canopy things that you can buy count as a, as, a, as a building. Who is that? Yep. Uh, through, the, through the chair. Um, so as, as the bylaw is written, uh, an RV would be permitted up to 3.7 meters in height. Uh, the enclosure within the building is if it's over 3.7 meters. Uh, that's the height of the RV regardless of where it's placed on a, on a lot. Right, so if they wanted to go more than 3.7, they would have to enclose it, and then that would be another process to get uh, building permits and everything for a building and setbacks and everything. Is that correct? Uh, through the chair, that's correct, yes. Okay, so this, okay, so that, that's a whole different, different process to, to get there. In one of the uh, aerial shots here, which I thought was quite interesting here, um, if that, that, uh, mobile home, could it move up to be in line with that red uh, truck? Because that yellow line is the actual property line. So that is allowed to pull forward, providing it's um, not over height. Is that correct? You can go longer if you, have a lengthy, if you have a longer driveway. So if your driveway goes down the side of the house, you can pull from the 
yellow line as far back as you need. And so you basically your excess uh, length just tucks in beside the house. Is that correct? Uh, through the chair, that would be correct. So they can park anywhere on the property. Yes. Right. So you could go you could go longer than the six point or the seven point six, providing the extra length tucks in behind the side of the house and not into the front of the driveway, which is technically not your property. Uh, through the chair, that's right. So the, the RV would need to be parked fully with, on private property, not extending into the boulevard. Right. And most people don't really know where that property line is. We can see it here because we're looking at an aerial map. But uh, I think this has been one of the challenges. People sometimes think that they, they can park right up to the curb or to where the sidewalk is. But in this case, they actually have to stay behind that imaginary line. Well, it's a real line, but it's an invisible line unless you know where your yellow or your white pegs are. Is that correct? Uh, through the chair, that would be correct, yes. So our bylaw enforcement would be required if to enforce this bylaw, they would have to locate the, either the pegs or use a satellite map to see if, the, uh, if there was a bylaw infraction. Is that correct? Through the chair, that's correct, yes. Okay, good, thank you. I wanted to know if I could add one thing to it. It's very short. If you're, if you're really brief, yeah. sir. I just wanted to mention that um, in one of the photos for my son, uh, that window, the fence is about uh, seven feet from his window. The trailer is parked right against the uh, fence. And so if people have said, well, what about a garage? Well, as you mentioned, if you built a garage, it would have to be uh, a minimum of four feet from the property line, which would mitigate some of that um, Ice or blockage of light because you would have you'd be further away from where the window is. That's all I wanted to add. Thank you. Other question. My other question, staff, was um, the resident here, and I, so I don't need to come back. But you mentioned about raising the fence, but there are bylaws on fence heights, correct? So the fence could still only be two meters or whatever the fence height is. So the rest would have, the screening would have to be done with natural trees. It couldn't be done by building the fence up because there'd be bylaws on height on heights on fence, correct? Uh, through the chair, that's correct. So we do have uh, regulations on the height of fences that are allowed. Okay, good. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other speakers to this item? Welcome. And if you could please state your name and your address for the record. Thank you. It's Paul Ballantyne. Address is 1750 Woodville Avenue. I am the owner, or used to be the owner of the other vehicle that was in those pictures. Um, Acting Mayor, Council, and City staff, um, I'm here to speak in support of the proposed bylaw changes. I'd like to start off with some of the reasons why families actually own a recreational vehicle or a trailer. For our family, it's so we can actually have longer and cheaper vacations as a family unit. We typically use our trailer six to eight weeks a year. Having a trailer means we don't have to pay for hotels. We don't have to go to a restaurant three times a day. It affords us the ability to stay together as a family, have longer vacations for extended periods. As far as storing it elsewhere, we've done that when we had the old trailer and we had to move it. It costs us around $200 a month. When it adds up over a year, it makes the cheapness of having a trailer for vacations not worthwhile. So I'd like to speak to the proposed changes. The first one I'd like to talk about is the removing the 4,500 GBW weight limit. To me, this is important because it doesn't affect RVs. It also affects people's personal vehicles on their lots. For example, my pickup truck, which is the red one that was in the pictures beforehand, it is no bigger than vehicles from years ago but the GVW ability of that vehicle has increased beyond the 4,500 kilogram limit. So it doesn't weigh that much, but its capability is higher than that. And because of that, it's actually illegal for me to park my own pickup truck, which is not a dually, it's a standard pickup truck, but I'm not actually allowed to park it in my driveway under the current bylaw. Now, thankfully, the city has not enforced that on me, but this would affect many of the residents in the city who have pickup trucks like myself that are not commercial vehicles. With regard to the proposed change to the length of RVs um, to 15.2 meters or maximum 50 feet, um, I'd like to point out that in the BC Motor Vehicle Act and regulations, there are already stipulations that regard the maximum length of vehicles allowed on BC roads. 
The maximum length of any motorhome currently on any British Columbia road is 14 meters or about 45 feet. The maximum length of any towed RVs will travel to their fifth wheel by law in BC is a maximum of 12.5 meters or 41 feet. So given that, um, people will not be seeing 50 foot RVs on their property. This, this is not possible under the current laws in BC. Furthermore, um, the question comes about will we start seeing 45 foot motorhomes on, on private property? And the answer is no. Given the city is asking for a height restriction of 3.7 meters or 12 feet, this will limit and not allow the tour bus style oversized RVs to be allowed. They will simply be over height. So the, the bylaw is being well balanced and it'll allow longer RVs while still restricting the oversized luxury touring buses. Some things that haven't changed are the allowance of having two RVs or an RV and a boat trailer on someone's personal property. Um, with regard to that, currently people are allowed to have two vehicles to a combination of 50 feet. I know there was some concern about parking being taken away from people's residences and people being having forced to park on the road. There will be no change under the current bylaw because people can right now with the current bylaw still do that. The proposed bylaw does not change that. If people are putting longer RVs on things, for example, sweet parking, there are bylaws that can be enforced to uh, deal with that and bring back the sweet parking. So what makes this change fair? It allows for bigger trailers if people have the parking space for it. It'll still be limited by the height restriction. Um, the current bylaw was put in place in 1971 and research done by city employee Sylvia Adamson, which provided to me, shows that the reason why the 25 foot limit was put in place, because this was the, the distance between the front of the house and the, city, and the city property line, which is 25 feet on the average house. So the spirit of this bylaw was put in place in 1971 so that vehicles would not park over the boulevard. It wasn't meant to deal with parking down the side of the house or parking in the backyard. So this bylaw, the length of 25 feet is now 46 years old. With regard to the previous pictures, I understand from neighbor residents it can be a concern, but in that situation, the length would not have mattered. 25 feet or under, it would still be the same thing. And I ask council, at what point does it become important where a person has a view out their side window? Everyone is, should be uh, allowed a view from their front window, but at what point do side windows become important and what point do views become important? I'd like to point out from the previous picture is that that house was offset to the side of the property and had that driveway not been on the side, the house would have been closer by eight feet to Miss Hamilton's house. And the house would be about, it's over twice as tall as the trailer itself. So had it not been for parking down the side, it would have been less like that residence and be more imposing with the house being next to it. She actually has a benefit the way it is right now. So in conclusion, I'd like to ask the city to consider updating this bylaw. It is 46 years old and the what's being offered by city staff and recommendations is fair and balanced. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Zarillo. Thanks, I have a number of questions and I don't wanna ask them all right now, but I wanted to address uh, one of the things that the speaker uh, educated me on and thank you for that. This is for staff actually. So is, it was stated that 14 meters is the largest vehicle allowed on BC roads. Is that um, the understanding of our staff as well, that 14 meters is the largest vehicle? Does anybody know the answer to that? Um, yes, uh, good evening, Madam Chair and members of council. Um, yeah, it, it, the proposed uh, amendments uh, to the bylaw, um, the regulations, um, don't really specify a maximum length of vehicle. It's just defining an area on the property, entirely on the property, not overhanging the sidewalk or boulevard, that you can park recreational vehicle, recreational vehicle and trailer. Um, the thinking has been, and Jeremy can help me if, with this if I need it, because he's really the, the mastermind behind this, is going back and looking at what the origins were. I think it was pointed out it was based on initially on a setback, the setback from a property line. 
and I think there's some logic to that. So if you can didn't provide that space within a setback, but in addition to that setback, have an additional area to, that um, and we thought up to a maximum of 15.2 meters would be sufficient. So um, it, it's using that setback distance and allowing for a combination of either two RVs or two trailers or a trailer and an RV, which is permitted under the uh, one of the other bylaws anyway. So it's just... It was a number that reached out to allow sufficient parking area. It wasn't to specify a, a maximum length. Okay, so I'm just I'm just trying to make some sense of that. So so we we don't have an answer from staff whether the 14 meters is the largest vehicle allowed on BC roads. Can I, inter can I interject for one second? It appears that Councillor O'Neill may have found the answer. Can, is it okay if he speaks? Yes, I have. Thank you. Under the uh, Recreational Vehicle Towing in British Columbia uh, PDF fact sheet, it says maximum length for recreational vehicles. The maximum total length for a motorhome is 14 meters or 45.93 feet. The maximum length for a towed recreational vehicle is 12.5 meters or 41 feet. The maximum overall length for combination is the truck and the trailer, 20 meters, or 65.6 feet. But the, obviously the question that we have before us deals with the motorhomes or recreational vehicles. So um, I believe that's what the presenter said. And thank you for allowing me to share the information with everybody. Thank you. Councillor Zarillo. Thank you very much, and thank you, Councillor O'Neill. So I wonder if we could just get some clarification then Again, because um, I'm looking at two reports here. I'm looking at the report from January 9, 2017, where the recommendation from <clears throat> staff is to retain the current vehicle length limit of 7.6 meters in the front yard. And then I'm looking from for the I'm looking at the report report for June 13th, where some of the changes are made. So if you could just restate that to me, Mr. McIntyre, the the, the current regulation is saying no more than 7.6 meters. Is that correct? Uh, through the chair, if I may. Yes, Mr. Keating. Uh, yes, the current uh, length limit for a recreational vehicle in the zones that we've been discussing is 7.6 meters. Okay. And what we're proposing is what as far as length? We're not having a restriction of length on the vehicle. We're having a restriction on the length of the driveway. If you could just clarify. What so, is Sorry, uh, through the chair, the restriction would remain 7.6 unless that property had a longer driveway or a parking pad that could accommodate a longer recreational vehicle. In that case, the RV can be as long as the space basically provides up to a maximum of 15.2 meters. So for example, if uh, a resident had a driveway and parking pad that combined to a 10 meter space, they would permit, be permitted to have a 10 meter recreational vehicle. Okay, so I guess I, it begs the question, why would we allow a recreational vehicle that's longer than a recreational vehicle would be allowed to drive there? Someone would get one towed there? Like, I know it's out of, very unreasonable, but it's possible that someone could have something there. So I guess I just want to understand why we wouldn't limit to what's in the, the within the law. Of BC. Mr. McIntyre? Yeah, I, I, again, <clears throat> um, the, the, it's looking at the area sufficient for storage and parking of these, these vehicles on the property. Um, uh, we did check the height, not the length. Um, I suppose those regulations can change over time. We we're just trying to um, pr provide or, or bring forward a logic. It would enable the two vehicles that are allowed under the bylaw currently, and this was the uh, the solution we've come forward with. And we're recommending. So I've got I've got a few I've got a few things to say, but I wanted to hear from the the, uh, the crowd first. So how do we do that? Because this was just in question to someone's uh, presentation. So will I be able to speak again with the questions that I have? Or? You have questions for the speakers? Staff. No, for staff. But I was going to wait till everyone was done speaking. Okay, I can call for more speakers. Okay. And then I'll have the opportunity to speak again. Okay, thank you. Councillor O'Neill, did you have something? 
No, that was no. just okay. the interjection that I had. Thanks. Are there any other speakers to this item? Are there any other speakers to this item? Third and final time, are there any other speakers to this item? Okay. So this item is now, I guess, not closed yet because you have questions, Councillor Zarillo? Yes, thank you. I just have a few questions that are uh, continuation on to that uh, about the driveway. So what my first question is, so if the resident does not have a driveway, but does have space, grass, for example, I've seen it in the city of Coquitlam where a, a recreational vehicle is parked on grass. Could they park their vehicle on grass, uh, horizontal, at, across the front of their house, or does it have to be on a driveway? Uh, if staff could request that uh, the clerk put attachment two from the bylaw up on the screen, please. Thank you very much. Um, so this sketch we've prepared just to, to show a few possible examples of where an, a recreational vehicle could be parked. Uh, so this is just a typical RS1 lot, 13 and a half meter wide, uh, with a few different uh, potential scenarios. Um, figure one just shows us a 17.6 meter RV with a 17.6 meter front setback. So you can see that it fully takes up that setback. Uh, figure two shows a bit of a shorter RV, but parked parallel with the street uh, in the front yard there. And then figures three and four show the options uh, along the side. Um, so a, a homeowner could certainly park an RV uh, parallel to the street in the front yard. Um, they wouldn't be permitted to park it on the grass because there are requirements in the zoning bylaw for a surface of, of a parking space, uh, which is asphalt, uh, concrete, or some other dust-free surface. So they would be required to do that. Uh, but they would be permitted to park it in the front yard, provided that they had an appropriate space to do so. Okay, so it's within the bylaw that it has to be asphalt, concrete, or some sort of gravel, correct? Correct, yes. So that's how, right. how are we enforcing that right now? Because I have seen RVs on grass, so how are we, how are we enforcing that right now? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Zarillo. So, um, Typically, these are done on a, on a complaints-based basis. Um, so if it was parked on grass, then a bylaw officer would, would head out there and deal with that. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, so my second question is also an enforcement question. Um, we currently have a bylaw that um, limits the weight of these vehicles. How are we enforcing that right now? Uh, through the chair, so uh, this is also on a complaints-based basis, uh, but RVs aren't aren't treated the same for the, the gross vehicle weight. And per the uh, proposed amendment, they'd also be removed from that weight restriction that we have in the in the zoning bylaw. Okay, so that's complaint-based. Okay, um, there was also mention that there can't be someone living in the RV, or there can't be used as a an Airbnb. Is 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 it in the bylaw now that they can't live in the RV? Uh, through the chair, that's correct. It is in our zoning bylaw that you can't live in an RV. And I'm aware of a couple of these, so how are we enforcing that right now? That would also be a complaints-based basis. Okay. So I just want to, I've got a couple more in this. So the other scenario that I'm aware of is that there's a number of folks in the city of Coquitlam who have larger lots where their brother-in-law, sister-in-law, in-laws that don't live at the residence park the, the vehicle at their home. So that's currently allowed, correct, in the city of Coquitlam? Under the current bylaw, you can, you can store for a family member or friend on your lot? Uh, through the chair, that's correct. There's no current regulations about the ownership of the RV that's parked there. So that'll be new to this bylaw, is that correct? Correct. So how will we enforce that? <laughs> I got the nod. Complaints based. Okay, I'm going to stop on those ones. I've got a few more, but I think the point is well made. Okay. Um, how we, uh, 
the other thing is on the June 9th, January 9th, 2017 report on page three, it talks about the length restrictions. I'm talking uh, page three, bullet number three. It says the length restrictions for the vote for the scanned municipalities um, is, is ranging from 4.9 to 8 meters. And then at the end of that report, it recommends no, no change in length. So I'm just wondering how it came about that we decided... Um, that we decided to go with just allowing a, an RV as big as the lot would allow. I guess I just want to get a little bit more understanding of that. Mr. Keating? Uh, so through the chair, so uh, as part of the municipal scan, uh, as indicated in, in the committee report from January, there is a pretty wide range of, of allowable lengths. Um, so we decided that there wasn't sufficient precedent for us to change based on any of that. Um, where the, the longer allowable length has come from was, um, was comments from, from council um, and, and residents as well, interested in, in seeing uh, a bit of an update to the bylaw, um, 7.6 meters or 25 feet. Um, back when it was originally written, may have fit most, if not all, RVs, but RVs have gotten larger over time. Um, and so we wanted to, to have the opportunity to modernize that a bit in a, in a sensitive way so that we weren't allowing um, very, very large vehicles uh, without proper screening, for the exa for example, or making sure that they're on a, a lot that can uh, sufficiently accommodate them. Interesting. Uh, so um, I notice on page two of the report dated January 9th, it also says that we, we get five about five complaints for overlength vehicles in a year and six overweight vehicle com complaints. So we get about 11 complaints in all. So I'm just, my question is if we see an increase in complaints, if this happened to go through tonight and we saw an increase in complaints, um, will the city relook at the bylaw? Um, is there a trial period for this? I mean, this is a, a relatively big change for folks that have had to store their vehicles in the past. So is there, is there a recourse if we end up doubling, tripling, ten times the, the amount of complaints that come through the, through the city? Mr. McIntyre? Uh, yes, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I can try to respond on that one. Um, the bylaws before councils uh, for consideration following the public hearing, and um, it, uh, if, if council chooses to proceed with the bylaw and get the, the, uh, the next readings and, and adopt it ultimately, it then goes on the books, and that, those will be the, the regulations that we'll, we'll work under. Um, there is no formal sort of review timeline for that or, or, or timetable to bring it back, but I think as with, with most bylaws, uh, once put in place, we see how they, they work. We, we, we monitor them, and if there's problems, uh, um, difficulties in administration and, and enforcement, um, the staff will bring that up, and you'll hear from um, residents or property owners that are affected, or council themselves will we'll, we'll, we'll get wind of it. So uh, certainly, there's always the option, the opportunity to um, bring bring things back at some point in the future. Okay. And my last question is just about home values, and I was wondering if there was any data or information about whether having an RV parked next to to a home uh, decreases its value, if there's any tangible or empirical data about that. Mr. Keating? Uh, through the chair, we, we don't have that data. It may exist, but it's not something that we have on hand. Okay. Well, I thank you for such a thorough examination, <clears throat> and thank you for the answers. Councillor Hodge? Yeah, just a, a follow-up question while well, this slide is up. Uh, so I had a question on, on the parking. Figure two. Um, the RV, um, could it extend into the driveway, given that, you know, somebody may park just one car in the driveway, because the RV could still be on the property, but could it extend beyond into the driveway if they wanted to have a, have a longer vehicle? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Hodge. Um, yes, the, the RV could certainly extend into the driveway. There's a couple of uh, physical limitations that aren't part of the, the bylaw regulations, but um, they would obviously need to be able to access their, their garage. Uh, and if they did have a secondary suite, um, that space would also need to be provided 
uh, in a non-tandem format, so we would need to make sure that that RV didn't uh, didn't restrict the use of those other parking spaces. Right. So that's where I was going with this in lieu of the new uh, secondary suite. Uh, that was sort of envisioned as the third spot, but uh, um, you could put the RV there and uh, put uh, one car in the driveway and put your tenant there. But if your RV extends, then you wouldn't be allowed to have a secondary suite because the RV is now basically blocking out one of the two parking spots in the driveway. So you could do it, but you wouldn't be able to do it with a suite. Uh, through the chair, um, it'll it'll be a bit uh, context dependent. Uh, so the sketches that I've provided here are uh, a 13 and a half meter wide lot, um, but we do have a number of lots throughout the city that are 15 or 20 meters wide. And so there are potential situations where you could have an RV that's parked parallel to the street, still have enough space for a third spot for the secondary suite and full access to the garage. Uh, so it, it would be quite context dependent. Okay. And. If um, I mean, figure four works, uh, provided the house was built far enough with a, with a wide enough easement to put the, uh, the, the RV down the side, and I think that's what I heard the, uh, one, of our, one of our speakers tonight say, that the house was built in such a way that it has the pad down the side. However, if you buy an existing house and you don't have the option, and you still want to have an RV that's, say, longer than uh, 7.6, could you go back to figure two and park it diagonally? You still don't cross the property line, but you tuck it up into the corner, and that allows you to put a longer uh, car there. Is there any restriction on how the car is parked, providing it just doesn't cross over the property line? Uh, through the chair, there wouldn't be a restriction, so they could potentially park it diagonally, yes, correct. Okay, thank you. Mr. Asmussen? Yeah, just on the parking issue, uh, on figure one, if you had an RV parked and you had a boat parked there, you would have no access to the garage, and that's allowed presently and will be allowed in the new bylaw? Uh, through the chair, that is correct, yes. That's my one concern. I don't mind uh, even the person, that, the existing trailer on the side, I don't mind the one on the front. The one I do think is problematic for me is allowing on the driveway. We have complaints throughout the areas about parking on the street lack of street parking, and uh, while people may not have a suite and we require a third parking spot, um, by taking up the whole garage and not having the garage, we're affecting neighbors. So that's the one issue I have about the whole plan is from figure two, three, and four, I'm all fine with it. But figure one, where you can, and I know it's on the existing bylaw, but we're in a different state today than we were when this bylaw, the old bylaw was created and we're having a greater problem with street parking. So that's the one issue I have with this bylaw. So thank you very much. Okay, because we continue the discussion, there might open up more questions, so I'm going to call for speakers again. Are there any other speakers on this item? Are there any other speakers on this item? Third and final time, are there any other speakers on this item? I declare this item closed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Next item, item two, is an application to amend City Coquitlam Zoning Bylaw number 3000 to rezone the properties at 811 Kelvin Street and 810 McIntosh Street and a portion of 804 McIntosh Street from RS1 One Family Residential to RS3 One Family Residential. This is bylaw number 4785. Okay. Oh, yes. Uh, Councillor Marsden? Yes, thank you. Uh, in an uh, abundance of caution, I am going to recuse myself from a discussion on, on this item. I recuse myself from the public hearing. Uh, my company does have a contract with a, with a company whose uh, principals have a, an affiliation with the proponent. As such, I am going to remove myself and ensure there's no potential conflicts. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of Council. My name is Jeff Denny. I'm a development planner and will present item two, a proposed rezoning for properties located at 804 and 810 McIntosh Street and 811 Calvin Street. The subject site is located at the corner of Como Lake Avenue and McIntosh Street. It consists of three lots. The site is currently zoned RS1, one family residential, and the surrounding context, the neighborhood is generally zoned RS1, one family residential as well. 
the site is located in the southwest Coquitlam area plan and it's designated one and two family residential as is the surrounding area. The applicant is proposing to rezone a portion of the site that's shaded in yellow on the screen from RS1, one family residential, to RS3, one family residential, to permit subdivision into six RS3 zoned lots and one remainder lot. The, re the remnant lot will remain zoned RS1. Staff recommend that council give second and third readings to bylaw number 4785, 2017. Thank you. There are a couple of registered speakers. I'd like to call up Ian McCaskill, first registered speaker. And his address is 949 Jarvis Street. Welcome. Evening and thank you for hearing me. Um, I'm drawn to appear before you, invited by the posted sign on the property in question, to register my opposition to the rezoning application under consideration. I'm opposed to the application because I see no reason why the zoning designation should be changed, and to make the change from RS1 to RS3 will create a precedent and an incentive for further property accumulations in the neighborhood by developers and more applications to carve up our neighborhood for private gain. Once the precedent is established, it will be a green light for developers to acquire contiguous properties in the neighborhood and make similar applications. I submit that the existing zoning is the most valuable designation collectively for existing owners and any gain that developers could make by upzoning particular lots would ultimately devalue the character of the neighborhood and consequently the remaining RS1 property values. We have seen a good deal of change in the newly constructed housing stock in our neighborhood and many owners have invested heavily on the assumption that the character of the neighborhood will be maintained. Their investment could be at risk if this proposal proceeds and the precedent is established. Last year, my property assessment increased 43% over the previous year and 18% in the year before. I imagine all owners in our neighborhood have experienced similar gains to my assessment. My point is that evidently our neighborhood is highly valued as it is with its existing zoning designation and thus should be maintained. There are many other neighborhoods in Coquitlam more suited to rezoning to achieve densification, if that is indeed the aim of the city, but not this neighborhood. Without dignifying the rezoning proposal at hand, I would like to point out to the committee that the proposed RS3 designation for redevelopment on McIntosh Street could be expected to create on-street parking congestion and a possible bottleneck for neighborhood traffic egress to Como Lake and ingress to McIntosh and Jarvis from Como Lake. With the existing width of the streets, only one car can pass at a time when cars are parked on both sides of the street. The anticipated result would be more traffic moving along Hibbert. For the most part, there are no sidewalks in the neighborhood and none on Hibbert. In concluding, I urge the committee to consider the neighborhood interest as paramount and not the developer's proposal. I further urge the committee to take a long view about planning for the community and not be directed by ad hoc development proposals which may generate a quick real estate gain but will ultimately cheapen the character of our neighborhood. I trust my submission will assist you in making a decision which reflects the desires of the residents and protects the character and value of our neighborhood for the long term. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, please be reminded, some of you may not have been here when I read out at the beginning of the meeting. There's no clapping or cheering or booing. So, thank you. Uh, the next registered speaker is uh, Mr. Alex Maltas at 976 Calvin Street. Good evening. 
Good evening. Thank you, Madam Chair and Council. My name is Alex Maltus. I'm a resident on Kelvin Street. I'm also a director of the Central Coquitlam Neighborhood Association, an association that was formed earlier this year to address and speak for the community, uh, particularly in respect of this development, but also future developments. I think many of you have seen some of the correspondence that I've sent to all of you, as well as some recent correspondence I've had with the mayor. And I don't intend to go through all of that again. I think uh, council has a good understanding of some of the concerns of the residents. Uh, what I really want to focus today is, is on some concerns about process and why I say and on my own behalf and on behalf of the association I represent that this current proposal should be rejected. This isn't the right way to, re to do development. We all know context-wise we're dealing with half a lot and one of the, probably the largest development properties in Southwest Coquitlam. Um, we're asked today to consider taking two existing homes, three existing homes, and creating three RS3 lots. In and of itself, it's easy to say that's not a big change. But the unspoken issue that none of us can really talk about today because it's not before us is what's going to happen to the remnant parcel. That's the issue that's motivated the community to uh, organize, to mobilize, and to speak out against this development. It's my submission that where we have a large lot like this, and we know there was a previous pre-application, and I think the developer, uh, to its credit, has been candid, that ultimately the goal is to do something higher density in the remnant lot. Where we have a property like this, we should, my submission, the city should not be considering partial rezoning of the, existing, of the existing area. If there's a plan for this lot, for this combined lot, and it's going to include multifamily, let's see it all now so we can have an open, clear, and transparent discussion. You'll hear concerns today about traffic, but a potential lane going in behind Como Lake, going in uh, parallel to Como Lake. It's really difficult for us to have that conversation with council today because it's not before us. And so we're give, be given uh, something that there was strong objection to, which was redevelop the whole property into two little bite-sized morsels. The concern we have today is that a decision that could be today, made today to rezone part of this property could have intended and unintended consequences for the remnant. So in my submission, good planning requires, I think it's, it's within the city's right and council's right to send the developer back and say, put a proposal together for the entire property or redevelop within the existing zoning. What we're really talking about is two extra lots, likely, maybe more, maybe, maybe I don't, I'm, I've never done the math to see how many RS1 lots, but until we have the entire picture before us, we say keep it RS1 or go back to the drawing board, put an entire proposal together so that the residents can have proper feedback so that the council, I'm sure, has questions about what's going to happen next. We have it before us. We know that there's some broader studies going on, arterial road studies, um, as well as uh, housing choices options that may in the next couple years affect the way that our community, our neighborhood is zoned and developed. Those are good processes because they actually allow for public consultation. Now, some may say it's not fair to make the developer wait for all those things to conclude before developing this, this property and there's a need for more housing now. On my respectful submission, if, if we're going to go, if the developer wants to go down this two-track road, keep the existing zoning, and then when it's ready to have a discussion as to what it wants to do, if it's before those studies are done, we'll deal with in this format. My submission really should wait until those, those other processes are done where there can be real meaningful community involvement and also we can actually address what we all anticipate to be the consequences of the ultimate rezoning and redevelopment of this property. So, so Again, I don't want to reiterate the concerns that the, the residents have already expressed, but from a process perspective, in my respectful submission, this is not the way to go about redeveloping a significant parcel of land in the city of Coquitlam. Residents Association objects more to the process and, and, and being told, I think, to some degree, well, we're only going to deal with these issues, don't worry, down the road, you can deal with the, uh, with the remnant if and when the developer moves forward. The developer drives the bus. What we're saying to council is today, council, 
listening to the residents should take control of the agenda and tell the developer and any developer come up with a plan that incorporates the entire property so that we can have a meaningful discussion. So those are my submissions. I see them over time. Um, if there's any questions, I'm happy to address them. Thank you. Thank you. I have a couple of questions. Are they for the speaker? Uh, Councillor Asmundson, followed by Councillor Wilson. Uh, thank you. Just, you mentioned about laneways. Um, council Paul's before I came on council, was that on arterial roads such as Como Lake and Austin, that there'll be no more driveways off those arterial roads. They'll all be, so if there's any redevelopment along Como Lake, all the driveways will be closed off and will be then required to have a laneway access off the back because as most people that live on Como Lake, it's very dangerous onto a busy arterial road. So laneways will be a matter of fact for all those houses. When they're, even if you're doing a, a single family house there, they will have to access a laneway off the back. They may or may not. We don't know what rezoning the entire property in RS1 lots or R would look what, like, right? I'm just saying, regardless of what the zoning is, and Mr. McIntyre wants to declare it, is that our policy on arterials, is, on those types of things, is to eliminate the driveways off the front, regardless of the type of development it is, to have laneways because it's safer. So whether it's RS1, whatever it is, we're, and as we go down there, they could build a 20,000 square foot house on that whole property still have to be accessed off the back. I think one important uh, thing to point out is there's currently no access from Como Lake to any of the subject properties. The access is off McIntosh and Kelvin right now. So that's the current situation and, and it brings up a good point because it's a bit of a unique area. Um, there isn't a lane there right now. And most of the other uh, side streets that, that, that are, are north and south of Como Lake have lanes. So obviously that's an important I appreciate what you're saying that, you know, in future, but right now we don't have any access to any of the subject properties off Como Lake. Yeah, no, I just want a clarification. You mentioned earlier that if it wasn't for the remnant property, you don't have a problem with the, the zoning that's being presented tonight. No, that, let, me, let me clarify. I, I think if without a complete plan, the residents have grave concerns as to... But, but just let me, I just want to go yes. back. Forget about the remnant property here, right? Because if there was an application, we'd still have to come back for another public hearing. All I want to talk about is, is what's before us tonight. And the impression you gave me was that this type of development isn't a problem. Well, no, there are concerns. It, it doesn't fit with the existing character. The, the lots are smaller. But again, I mean, I'm being forthright and honest. The bigger concern is the entire parcel. And, and if we, we haven't seen a proposal, if there was a proposal before council, say, hey, let's rezone the entire parcel in RS3 and this is how we're going to accomplish it, the, the neighborhood would have something different to say. But it's the, the, the spot rezoning of a spot rezone that is a particular concern to us. But of, of these properties, others will speak about changes to the character, narrower lots. I can also point in the, in the staff made recommendations to address some of those concerns, none of which were followed in respect of those RS3 lots. So I don't want to be taken to say that I have no issues just with the RS3. We do have concerns. The bigger concern is that we're dealing with half the property now and, and half later. And there's no concerns in the neighborhood about the change in the character with, I think there's some six, 7,000 square foot houses being built in that area. You know, I'm, <laughs> on, on, I, I act for, or I, I am a member of, of a residence association that has hundreds of members. Um, sure, one or two people, that's a concern about, about size. But if the houses aren't going to be, respectfully, all that much smaller or all that much cheaper on these RS3 lots than on the RS1 lots. Thank you. Councillor Wilson. This question is for our staff. Uh, Mr. Maltus had some suggestions about how to proceed with um, rezoning the whole area rather than uh, two parcels uh, one at a time. Could our staff explain what our, our legal requirements as a city uh, would be in this case according to the community charter? Um, through the chair, uh, responding to Councillor Wilson, um, the rezoning application we have received in process is for the two properties at the back uh, to RS3, from RS1 to RS3. 
Um, and that's our <clears throat> responsibility when those applications come in is to, uh, to review and process them and bring them forward. We, uh, um, so the staff level don't have an ability to hold something up and say, well, what about the rest of the property? It should be a, an overall unified application. Um, the property owner, the applicant chooses the form of application they want to submit. That's reviewed and that's ultimately what's brought forward to council. And that's what we have us, you know, before us tonight. And so we would we would not be able to um, force the developer to bring both parcels at one time. The city does not have a legal ability to compel someone to bring forward an application for a property. And the fact that the developer was. Uh, didn't follow through on some of the recommendations from our staff. Again, there's there's nothing to preclude uh, this from coming to council for rezoning. Uh, again, through the chair, um, <clears throat> that's correct, Councilor Wilson. Uh, you know, through the the back and forth of an uh, application uh, review process, there may be suggestions made by staff that we feel um, may go towards addressing some of the concerns we're hearing, um, and that. <laughs> then rest with the developer, the applicant to decide whether they want to incorporate that or not. Um, and now we're here before council at public hearing. And uh, I would suggest that's uh, yet additional information that council has at hand. You're hearing from the public tonight. There's been the, the staff reports that have led up to this point. Uh, there's all that information and we may hear from the applicant himself. Uh, and it's ultimately for council to decide that, that uh, rezoning application. Thank you. Councilor Hodge. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm just quickly just uh, scanning through this because I just raised a question in my mind. Is uh, We refer to the piece of property, the one facing Coma Lake, as the remnant property. Has, has the three properties actually been uh, combined and legally become one property? Or is it actually three? Because we refer to it with three different addresses. Uh, so I'm just wondering if... Uh, if there's a, is this an actual subdividing off of that piece of property, or is it still a standalone pro property that's owned by the same uh, uh, owner? Through the chair to Councillor Hodge, it's uh, currently three legal lots at this time. So, in theory, the developer could have sold off the front piece, and then the development that would sever. The discussion was that I'm just trying to sort of get around the legal discussion here between what's before us and what could happen. So I, I'm just sort of wondering if you, what you're saying is it is a separate lot. I'm just wondering why we refer to it as a remnant. And then usually that's when you parcel off something and leave a piece. Mr. Denny? Through the chair to Councillor Hodge, uh, there is a small piece of that property fronting uh, Como Lake that is included in the, uh, the subdivision for six RS3 lots. That's what I was looking at there. So that, that's not just an overdraw, it, that is actually, so part of uh, 804 is required to make the other two work. So for that reason, that does bring that property into, into play. Okay, that's better. Okay, good. Okay, that was my question. Thank you. Councillor Reed. Thank you. My question has to do with some of the alternative layouts and the modifications. And um, you have suggested that it could be done by having 49 foot lots, correct? Through the chair to Reed? Councillor Reed, that's correct. Okay. And. Um, it's proposed for 46 feet, correct? Through the chair, that's correct. Okay. So you want to an, a register a restrictive covenant that would limit the maximum house size to 5,500 square feet, which is larger than any of the homes in that area. Uh, through the chair, uh, yes, that's correct. 5,500 square feet is the approximate size of some of the recent constructions. That seems like a lot of density on that lot to me. Um, actually, there would be no 
One of the things about a neighborhood like that is you drive through and it's the actual street feel, it's the, um, the neighborhood feel, and with this you're going to have a patch of grass that you're not going to be able to lie down on, I would think. Um, I, I'm kind of disappointed that we're not dealing with some of the modifications that could make this more palatable to the neighborhood. I, um, some of the contextual concerns raised by the residents and the staff, you know, this is so hard for us. It's, you know, I've lived here for a gazillion years because I'm only 38, of course, but I've lived here for many, many, many years. And when I moved out here, it was a, a basic lot was 50 by 120. That was, you know, a 6,000 square foot lot. And these lots are going to end up being just a tinker under 6,000 square feet. So they're not a bad size lot. It just depends how they're fitted into the neighborhood, and what context that we could fit them in. Unfortunately, in the life that we're living now, our days of letting the little darlings out in the backyard to play games and stuff are, is almost not there anymore. We're, we're having to go down and densify our areas, and it's, I, we need to keep some areas for families. So I am not having too much trouble with the 6,000 square foot lots or 59, 52 or whatever they are. What I am having trouble with is the size of the houses that we're going to plop on the lots that are then going to make it look so crowded. And I also agree um, that the remnant, I get why you have to take it off, but I can get that you feel uncomfortable about leaving what you call a remnant, which is the lot facing Como Lake. But it has to come up for its own public hearing. And you'd all have opportunities to do something there, and it can't be too many things. So you'd still have time to come. And when that comes, whether it comes when we do the um, corridor studies or 10 years from now or five years from now or whatever it is. but. Um, Thank you for answering those questions. Thank you for your input. Thank you. Are there any other speakers to this item? Come on up. Please state your name and address. Yes, good evening. My name is Samantha Davey, surname spelled D-A-V-E-Y. I live at 996 Jarvis Street here in Coquitlam. Uh, Jarvis Street runs parallel to McIntosh. It goes north-south, and I live on the northern end in the cul-de-sac. Uh, I'm here before you as a member of this community. Uh, I'm a lawyer. I've been practicing as a criminal prosecutor for the last 15 years. I've been living in this community for the last nine years, and I have a eight-year-old son here who attends Harborview, which is the local elementary school. Uh, I came out here tonight, dragged him after soccer practice tonight, because I want to stand in solidarity with my neighbours who are opposed to uh, this plan as it's being put before Council today. I'm uh, opposed to this for two main reasons as somebody who lives in that area. My first concern is that McIntosh Street exits onto Como Lake Avenue. And one thing that you can't tell from looking at these little maps is that between Blue Mountain on the west and Porter on the east, the street goes up in a rise. It rises and it comes back down, and there's very poor visibility on Como Lake in either direction. I have real concerns that if we increase the densification, uh, the traffic, the, the cars at McIntosh, where they meet Como Lake, that that is going to pose a safety risk to the members of my community as we're pulling onto Como Lake and off of Como Lake. Because it's very hard to see when you're on McIntosh pulling onto Como Lake, cars coming from the eastbound direction and coming from the westbound direction. So that's the first concern I have. The second concern I have is that it will change the character of the neighborhood that I'm living in. The individuals who want to uh, develop these properties, they have one motivation, and that's profit. And it's profit alone. They are not members of this community. They are not members of our community. And I, and I say that in solidarity again with my neighbors. I uh, used to live in downtown Vancouver. I used to live in uh, the West End, and then I lived in Kitsilano. And when I bought in 2009, I came out to Coquitlam for one reason. I was uh, eight and a half months pregnant, and I wanted my son to grow up in a 
family neighborhood. I wanted him to have the opportunity to play, uh, to play hockey on the street, and he is able to do that with his friends on, on Jarvis Street right now. And I have concerns that if we in increase the densification of this area, there's going to be more traffic, and it will lose that character. It will lose that family feel. If we start allowing developers who have no ties to our community to come in here for profit motivation development, that's the thin edge of the wedge. We start with two lots being divided into six lots. What's next? What's happening to remnants? What's happening to, to uh, other houses down the street? That's the thin edge of the wedge. And I, uh, I stand here before you th this evening to put my foot down as a member of this neighborhood to say, we don't want it. We don't want this densification in our area. We want our kids to be able to, to, to play in the streets and not be worried about the extra cars, the extra people, and uh, the growing busyness in our area. Those are my submissions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there, are there any other speakers? Councilor Zarella, did you have a question? I do have a question for staff just on that uh, that last speaker. And I was looking to the report because it mentioned, mentioned made that this um, this developer has doesn't have any, um, um, I can't remember the wording, but uh, any uh, footprint in the community. And I just wanted to understand, because I don't see an address here for the developer. Usually there's an address. I'm wondering if staff, through the chair, if I could just understand. Um, there's an address. Even even a corporate office, if there's a corporate office in the community. Mr. McIntyre. Yes, thanks, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I'm, I'm just looking at the uh, uh, the report from July 10th, uh, uh, earlier this year, when the, the bylaws were brought forward. Um, in, our, in our standard uh, format, it has the name and owner of the applicant, and that's um, Harmon Developments, and it has the address of the property. It doesn't have the address of the developer, but they are um, a local development company. Um, council may recall they've done uh, a number of heritage revitalization agreement application, HRAs. Um, so they, they are from Coquitlam. Okay. Um, that's good. Thank you for that. Anything else? Thank you. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Bob Jansen. I live at 965 McIntosh Street, so I'm down further north from the development. I wish to speak and support that the application be denied. It is not within keeping of the neighborhood. The developer, when they purchased the land, knew what the zoning was. It is suitable for RS1 zoning, and it should be RS1 zoning. And I would ask, and I will not repeat what the others have said more eloquently, that because the developer does require a portion of the remnant, that it is subject to your purview to demand to see the whole development now. If the developer wishes to take the two lots without any other approaching onto the third one, then I understand what staff has said. But if he wishes, or they wish, sorry, to have a portion of the remnant, then we should hear what the plan is for the whole development so that we are not facing an uphill battle for the last little bit. The developer, as someone said, is very clear. His first proposal a year ago was to put multiple family homes on the total parcel. The open house in January, again, multiple family homes on the whole parcel. This seems to be a strategy to get something now to assist him in his profit motives and get multiple families on Como Lake at a later date. So I ask you, please, ask to see the whole plan before you approve this plan. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Zerillo? Yeah, I, um, I, I haven't been uh, closely involved. I, haven't, I don't think I've met with anyone from the community, but I have been following this for the last year. And I would like to understand just from staff, um, I think Councillor Wilson asked it a little bit earlier, but just to, under, to understand, like there was an, there was, can council ask for the whole plan? I guess I guess it's a reiteration of what uh, Councillor Wilson said because I, when this first came a year ago, I, I would I was interested in seeing the whole plan, but I can't necessarily uh, control that. 
And I think there's a back and forth that happens before it ever gets to council. So I'd just like to understand how much influence council has on seeing the whole plan. I mean, I didn't even see the community input that happened, the sessions that happened where the plan was being developed between the community and the developer. I didn't even see that. So how much exposure is council supposed to have and how much are they allowed to have when it comes to private land and development? Mr. McIntyre? Yes, <clears throat> yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, a couple of things, and I'm sorry, I might have been a little uh, misleading in my earlier comments. Uh, it is correct that a portion of that third lot, um, you know, 804 McIntosh, I guess is the address, um, is included with this subject rezoning application. My understanding is they need a, a, a sliver off the back part of that uh, to add to the other two parcels to create the, the necessary uh, width lot widths for the RS3 zoning. Um, in that, um, and uh, Jeremy can correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff can correct me if I'm wrong, but we would look at that, that remnant parcel and under the zoning that it would remain RS1, could it still be developed as RS1? And um, the answer would be yes. Where we uh, didn't even at the staff level are Curious about that is typically it's on larger sites where there's assemblies and there may be property that's left behind. This is the infamous orphan property, and we always want to make sure that there's uh, that's developable on its own, and that's something that we we uh, staff ask for, and often that's what's brought forward to council. So there's an assurance that the the remnant parcel can be developed uh, without jeopardy. Um, the more difficult question to answer is what can council ask for, and um, Again, uh, council has many things in front of you here tonight. You've got the various staff reports, you've got our comments, you're hearing from the public, the applicant may wish to speak. You take that all into consideration and then you, in the end, determine what's in the public interest in, in terms of that rezoning application. You may want to set conditions. Uh, we've, uh, the staff recommendations for, for second and third readings, there may be some follow-up direction that you want staff to do with the applicant. Um, I believe that was noted in the, the chairman's uh, opening remarks about uh, a direction back to staff. Um, and that's one avenue. And in that, there can be requests for consideration of changes, you know, lot configurations or additional information. Um, you know, there always is that ability for, for council to, to look for further information before you make your decision. But, uh, at the end of the day, it's council's decision to make. Okay, and I'll just clarify while we're on the subject. So the RS3, as we're seeing it bolded here, is not incorporating any lane at this point in time. So if it if it stays forward where the 804 remains uh, RS1, there will be no lane in the back. There will need, be no back access. Is that correct? Through the chair to Councillor Zolero, that is correct. Okay, so for our remnant lot, uh, what is the largest house that can be built on that remnant lot if it stays uh, RS1 like this? I mean, I think it's going to be what the footprint. I can't even imagine how big this thing can be at 45%, but we might as well go for it. What would the size be? Uh, through the chair, we... We don't have that exact calculation, but for a, a typical RS1 size lot, that's a minimum of 7,000 square feet. Uh, a house in, in excess of 8,500 square feet could be constructed on a on a 7,000 square foot lot. Okay, but there would need to be a lane allowance. We need to create a lane, correct? Uh, in order to, through the chair, in order to facilitate a, a future subdivision of that lot, uh, a lane would be required. But not even a future subdivision. So if this 804 stays, hypothetically, if we, hypothetically, if we go, if this, what we're seeing on screen goes tonight, where we have six new lots and one large lot that we're calling remnant lot, and that one doesn't get adjusted, there's a front entry right now from Como Lake, correct? Right? Through, uh, Mr. Denny? Th through the chair, current access is off McIntosh Street. Okay. 
Okay. So this will, if, if somebody comes in and buys this whole lot and makes a 40,000 square foot, for, let's just say a 10,000 square foot footprint, they have no obligation at this point in time based on our bylaws to create any sidewalks, curbs, gutters, anything like that. They can just build a big house on here and leave the access as is. Mr. Yeah, I'll speak to that. A couple of things there. Um, the question about the lane, no, the lane would only come into play if there was to be a further subdivision or some other development. Um, as noted, the access to that property is off of Macintosh right now. If someone came in on that remnant lot with a single family building permit application, they wouldn't get a driveway uh, permit uh, approval coming off of Como Lake. That's just, uh, um, would be undesirable and dangerous. So they did have to get access off uh, Kelvin or off Macintosh to that remnant lot. In terms of the site servicing, uh, we've just into a program now recently um, uh, completed earlier this year, wherefore um, the intention was to sort of level the playing field, if you will, that for uh, single family uh, dwelling construction, just simply going through the building permit process would be obligated to uh, um, up, upgrade the frontage requirements as if they were going through a development application, subdivision application, what have you. So um, whatever was um, deficient on that frontage, be it sidewalk or street trees or street lighting, um, I think all the curb and gutter is in from my recollection. Um, but if it was a single family building permit application, they would be, that would be one of the requirements of that, uh, of that application. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak to this item? Okay, come on up. Good evening. Good evening, uh, Ron Wu, 976 Macintosh Street. I first got involved with this project over a year ago as a log watch person in the area. We found out about this development uh, in July, and we collected 350, 315 signatures protesting this uh, development. Originally, I can't remember the numbers, but something like a 30 unit development was proposed in that area. And um, that represented about, uh, I think, 80% of this population uh, in that area. <coughs> and it was collected in the summertime in July, and uh, we <coughs> presented to the city planning department in August. And I think, excuse me, as a result of that, the uh, developers, I think, were asked by the city planning development to hold some public hearings. I think there are three. And at one of them, I met Terry Towner, Chris Wilson, and Mayor Stewart. And I think I got the feeling that the council is aiming for higher density, and I can appreciate that. And I've gone through a process of uh, re-examining my thoughts about RS1. I think uh, with uh, housing the way it is, we need to re rethink how the younger people are going to fit into our communities. I liked May Reed's comment about uh, the nature of the community. I've lived in my house for over 40 years. Originally, I bought it for location, and uh, it's a really nice area, and I was gonna move, but I really like the area so much, we have stayed. So, <clears throat> the original um, proposals included um, laneways, that's why we talk about lanes a lot. For example, one of the people in my neighborhood is a fireman, and he was one of the first people I heard talk about requiring a laneway for uh, fire departments to access uh, a 30-unit uh, development. Um, I have some notes here. Macintosh, I, I know Alex said that we'll be talking about that. Somebody actually went out and measured Macintosh up here. It's uh, 27 feet 11 inches wide and Porter is 35 feet, four inches wide. But this area, 
with a lot of people, over 100 people, um, exit either Macintosh or Porter. And if you include Kelvin, and all those, if you're aware of the nature of that um, area, they all exit through um, Blue Mountain and Como Lake. So there's a lot of traffic that has to exit uh, that particular area. And I can appreciate why Kelvin people would, Kelvin Street people would be against this development because uh, if that remnant lot was to be developed, if I was a developer, I would look at that remnant lot and say, we'll build the 30 unit place, but we should also include the places to the west of that, which are occupied by single people living on their own. And there was a lot that was further down that has just been purchased, I don't know by who. And historically, um, if I was the developer and I purchased these properties for seven million a few years ago, I would look at getting my six million out from this uh, RS3 development and I could hang on to that remnant lot until the next council or the next uh, the rezoning application would permit me to um, develop the rest of this, uh, this parcel. And um, that would make it profitable for me to, to do that. So anyways, in conclusion, I have um, two main points. One is I followed this development from a year ago and I've seen three open houses. I actually spoke with, with Mayor Stewart at one of them, and he said that, um, off the record, I suppose, but Coquitlam um, Council is really trying to help uh, people with affordable housing, and he felt that RS1 might not remain in this neighborhood. So, um, the second point is that, uh, it would change the nature of the neighborhood. I have, uh, as Block Watch person, I have uh, contacts with most of the people on Jarvis, McIntosh, a lot on Kelvin, and even the neighborhood to the west of Blue Mountain. And um, it just changes the nature of that whole neighborhood, the Harbor Chines area. I mean, right now we're struggling with bears, but uh, that's a totally different story. But if I turned around, I could probably name a lot of the people in the audience, probably about 50%. Mm -hmm. Five minutes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wu. Well, that's, that's my thing. Oh, okay, so that was my main point, this nature of the neighborhood and, um, we followed this development. I know city planning has spoken to the uh, developers. I don't know if uh, the council was aware of this, but they did ask uh, the, the developers to uh, try to connect with the neighborhood. I know, for example, uh, some of our group. Hey, Mr. Wu, you'll have to wrap up your comments. Okay, Please. all right, I'm done, thank you. Um, can I ask you a question? On this particular land use in front of us tonight, yes. are you for it or against it? I couldn't really tell from your comment. Oh. Pardon? I'm against the, okay. the proposal. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, any other speakers? Okay, come on up. Okay, you'll be, you'll be next, sir. You'll be next. Oh, sorry. Come on up then. Welcome. If you could just say your name and address, please. Good evening, Madam Chair, respected councillors. Uh, my name is Graham Hung, 829 Macintosh Street. And uh, I will quickly summarize uh, the main points that we've uh, already discussed. Uh, I appreciate Councillor Reed's uh, uh, mentioning that, you know, the families nowadays seem, 
seems to be having these postage stamp uh, backyards with with the large houses on on small lots, uh, because I I, I th uh, think that uh, redevelopment shouldn't be ad hoc. It uh, should have a, a, a plan as follow the zoning plan, where, whereby residents and future residents have confidence uh, in moving into neighborhoods and paying uh, top dollar for these properties, one. Uh, two, uh, I can unreservedly say that most of the residents in our neighborhood and beyond uh, are not in favor of this type of uh, redevelopment, uh, where the, the neighborhoods become a hodgepodge of uh, different housing. Uh, admittedly, we are we are all sympathetic uh, for for, uh, for uh, people requiring affordable housing, but uh, this isn't the way to go. And uh, thirdly, I think the traffic pattern is a major major concern. Um, I'm referring to the property on the north east corner of Coma Lake and McIntosh. Uh, there was a house built there with a lane, lane house, and we were referring to, to lanes. And the owners there, I think they, they, they have a secondary suite and they had a car parking almost right to the corner of Coma Lake Avenue. Uh, whereas uh, mo most of us coming back home in the evenings would almost run in, into the uh, 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 rear end into the back of the parked car if uh, if the lighting over the, if it was a rainy night and uh, also the corner of Mac Macintosh and Coma Lake is uh, a high collision uh, point uh, just two weeks ago there, there was a fire truck and several police cars and and I'm sure that if you look up the police records you'll, you you will see see the number of uh, collisions that, that's occurring. We, we've already got traffic lights uh, on the corner of Porter and Coma Lake. But uh, McIntosh uh, is, is uncontrolled. So uh, it, it's a high, uh, high ac accident uh, uh, point. So these are the things that I, I like to bring to, to to the notice of the council. I, I'm also the real estate agent uh, uh, as well, and I, I know that it will definitely affect the values of the, uh, of the properties. And it's, it's not just our neighborhood, but all, also uh, the extended neighborhoods, because people will no longer have uh, confidence in, in uh, existing c city zonings. And I, I feel that um, as residents, uh, of this city as uh, 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 the city council and the councillors itself, uh, we, we should uh, at least guarantee that there is, is uh, 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 a certain zoning plan that uh, people can rely on. Uh, so the, these are the points I would like to make. Councillor Oh, sorry, Councillor Wilson. A um, question for Mr. Hung. Um, you, uh, we've heard from a few speakers about uh, how dangerous uh, McIntosh is turning on Tacoma Lake. Um, I would assume people who are, are not comfortable with that intersection would go down Hibbard to Porter and turn on Tacoma Lake from Porter, is that correct? Well, I, I attempt to do that 90% of the time. I attempt to do that night, but uh, sometimes, you know, if, if one is uh, uh, heading west on Coma Lake, uh, it's not logical to, to make a detour to, uh, through Hibbert Porter and then, then take a turn on the uh, 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 As a personal matter of fact, about nine years ago, I had a severe accident uh, uh, close to Porter and uh, Coma Lake. 
at, so, the, at the traffic. At that, that in the port intersection, someone was uh, taking the children to, uh, I think, uh, uh, fetching the children at, uh, from Harborview. So to, to increase the, the traffic through this neighborhood, I think, would be highly, highly hazardous. And I'm not talking about street parking or anything else. Uh, I, I'm just t talking about the volume, volume of, of traffic and the, the incident of, of, of accidents. And I, I don't know through the years that I've been there how many fire trucks and po police vehicles uh, attending to severe, severe inju injuries. Uh, a, a couple, uh, elderly couple crossing uh, the road uh, was taken out one time and they both both died. It was so. At Macintosh or at Porter? No, not at Macintosh. In in this this uh, 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 like between Gatonsbury and, and and Blue Mountain. You know, in that particular section, because it is there's two schools. One has to remember there's, there's the Porter Elementary, the Har Harbour View Elementary, and there's all, also the the uh, Coma Lake Park. I, I don't want to sound, uh, I mean, I appreciate uh, the information you've given, and I really don't want to sound um, insensitive to, to anybody in the audience. But almost every public hearing we hold, um, people come and they talk about the traffic on their street. <laughs> and it's just, an, it's, a, it's, 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 it's similar throughout, throughout the whole city, uh, unfortunately. And, and as, as a, as a council, you know we're we're trying to to deal with the the number of people that want to live in our city. We're trying to do gentle densification. We're trying to manage uh, traffic as best we can. Um, and so I, I I really appreciate your your comments on the traffic there. Um, and it's the same same comments we're hearing in every part of the city. Well, I would invite Councillor Wilson to. Uh, park there uh, during uh, peak hour, and then and watch some of the traffic patterns and incidents that that happen. If 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 I may. I, I, again, I, I don't want to sound. Um... But uh, anyway, that's one of the points that I I, I brought up because I have witnessed so many so so many incidents, uh, Councillor Wilson. Okay, thank you, Councillor Zerlo. Thank you. You mentioned about the planning and that is something that we hear quite a bit and it was even in our um, satisfaction citizen survey this year that the residents are concerned that we're doing planning. And I was wondering if I could take this opportunity through the chair to ask um, planning and development if we could get a look at an OCP map for this area just to understand what were the zones that were uh, planned for this area, because I can see that these lots are quite uh, quite large and quite forested, so um, they did have the potential at probably ever, for a long time to be redeveloped. I just want to understand what the OCP says about them. Mr. Denny? Through the chair to Councillor Zerillo, uh, this, the OCP map and designation is uh, uh, on the right of that slide right there. And although that's just a small portion uh, of the neighborhood, going further north from that, it, it is the same designation for one and two family residential for that general area. Okay, so could I please hear the zonings that are allowed in the yellow one and two family residential, please? Without an OCP change, what are the zonings that are allowed? Through the chair to Councillor Zerillo, uh, the zonings that are permitted are the RS1 yep. zone, yep. and uh, there's a provision in the OCP to allow the RS3 zone. Okay, and um, I have a cheat sheet which I printed off today, but if you wouldn't mind for the audience just letting us know what is an RS1 and what is an RS3. Through the chair, uh, an RS1 zone, uh, the minimum lot size is 7,000 square feet. Yep. And in the RS3 zone, the minimum lot size is 6,000 square feet. Okay, and both allow for a uh, single family home and a suite, right? Through the chair, that's correct. And do they also allow for a single family home and a carriage house or garden cottage? Through the chair, that's not permitted. Nope, just a, just a home and a suite, right? 
That's correct. And what about duplex? Are any of these eligible for a duplex? Not under the, this zone, no. Okay, not even 804? No. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Hung, do you have another question? or? Any? Nope. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other speakers to this item? Good evening. Hello, um, I'm Janine McNeely, and I live at 1003 Kelvin Street, which is at the very north end of Kelvin Street. So I'm here today, I was walking my dog, and I saw the little signs posted that said there was a public hearing, which I would like to note that the next day when I came back, both of them had been taken out of the ground and were put face down on the lawn, so that's a bit suspicious. But anyway, so my biggest concern, I've lived at my house at the north end for 23 years. I've seen a lot of development happen, especially at the north end. Residents will know there used to be about eight, six to eight lots that were all forested. All the forest has been taken down and then these big monster homes have been put up. And the number one thing that we've noticed is the parking. None of those houses have designated parking for their tenants. And while I read in the PDF that you'd put on the Coquitlam website that these houses will each have one designated parking spot for each basement suite, um, I think most of us know that's not really enough. Most people that live in basement suites, um, it used to be like a single person kind of thing, but the ones that live there now, their families were both like, both parents would have their own car, so one of them is always parking on the road. And for us at the north end, Leland Street, it's almost impossible to drive down the road when they've got cars on both sides parked from all the tenants. So my concern is that adding six more houses with apparently 12 different families living there, how are we going to be able to continue driving down our own streets if there's this much cars parked in the neighborhood? And finally, 811 Kelvin Street is one of the most beautiful houses in the neighborhood, and it would be a shame to tear it down and put up a bunch of cookie cutter homes. Thank you. Francis Rillo? Yeah, I had a question about 811 because it is very pretty and I'm not sure, um, do you know any of the heritage about 811 or? Um, I grew up with the family, one of the girls that lived there is a year older than me, we went all through school. I know one family from what I know, they used to own all three lots and then it was subdivided among the kids and then, yeah, there you go. But I don't know the heritage of the home specifically, just I know the family that lived there before. So through the chair, through the staff, sorry, I think there is uh, a mention of it in the report about not being uh, on our list of, of heritage uh, homes. But was there something in this report or was it a diff different report I was reading this week that talked about um, potentially a heritage type home that was built in, what, 1960 or something like that? Mr. Denny? Through the chair to Councillor Zarillo, uh, in the report we make reference to the existing house on uh, 804 McIntosh Street, the, oh, the large lot front in Como. Yes. And that's the 1960s one? That's correct. Okay, so do we have any details on the house on 811? Uh, through the chair, we do not. Okay. Thank you for bringing that up. I, I, when, I, when I went by, I, I did notice it's a very beautiful house. Thank you very much. Any other speakers to this item? Okay. Oh. Okay, well, you'll be next. You'll be next. Okay, Bev Carter, 876 Calvin. Lived on the street since I was three years old. Anyways, my biggest concern, because I won't be able to sleep at night, I'm all excited here, um, is when you talk about the remnant property, you talk about having to put an alleyway behind it eventually. The Kelvin Street and Blue Mountain Street is in the Harborview catchment, and no mom in their right, I know you hate talking about traffic, but no mom in their right mind is going to go out on Como Lake to go back to Kelvin. So what we're going to have is moms speeding down Kelvin Street to cut through that alley to get back over to Harborview. And I worry that if you leave that as a remnant, no matter how you develop it, you can't fix it. It will always be need that alleyway, and you're going to have all the 
the 9 o'clock and the 3 o'clock and the noon traffic go firing down Calvin Street, firing up that alley to make it to Harborview, and now you've got all that density on Macintosh to boot, something's going to happen. And I know you hate talking about traffic patterns. I get it. But it is putting the community at risk. And that really concerns me, and I have to speak to that, because when something happens, and it will, I don't want to be the one that didn't speak up and say, hey, you developed in a way that wasn't responsible simply because you didn't know the neighborhood. So that's all I have to say. I'm going to sit down. Thank you. OK. Welcome. My name is Lynn Hussey, and I live at 994 Jarvis Street. Um, I'm just going to repeat a couple of the same things, but I did write a few notes, so I wanted to get them out. Um, my concern as well was parking. Um, with the homes being proposed along Macintosh, I can hardly imagine the number of cars associated with them because there because there'll be two families in each, I'm sure, and they're designated two parking stalls. They'll have tenants, secondary suites, grown children, and there'll be more cars parked. There. Now, I'm the one that went and measured the streets today because Macintosh is only 27 feet 11 inches wide as opposed to Porter, 35 4. Um, and somebody sort of suggested that we could possibly keep driving past our street and turn at Porter and then come back. But does that seem fair so a developer can squeeze in six more houses that everybody for basically four whole blocks has to go further? to avoid all the cars parked in that short little stretch there that you have to squeeze through because as it is now, there is a lot of cars parked and there's a lot of big houses that have been redeveloped on our streets with secondary suites. Um, so this will just be more condensed. Um, one of the problems is if you, okay, so you have these people parking on the street now they're, where will they park? They'll have to go further down the street, or maybe they'll have to park on Hibbert. And like my question is, if you're a homeowner on Hibbert or a little bit further on down McIntosh, do you have the right to the house, to the parking spots in front of your house? Because so to me, it's just setting up for fights in the neighborhood. I mean, because there are going to be more cars, and they're going to have no place to go. So they're going to have to go down the street, and they're going to have to go on Hibbard for the people that paid premium price to pay there, and they're going to have extra cars in front of them. Um, I'd like to. I'd like there to be a sensible decision as far as the traffic flow goes. Um, the New Verquitland Safeways entrance off Como Lake is a place where I've seen two rear enders already, because they put that little entrance off right by Clark, and I had phoned the city saying when it was being built. Really? Are you really doing that? I can't believe that you're actually doing that. And sure enough, there it is. And, and there has been accidents. Like I say, I've seen two. And I just want to stop this before we have accidents at our corner. Um, the, the house on the corner that people were referring to on the northeast side has, I went today and looked at it, I actually took pictures. It has probably enough parking for probably six to eight cars, has four in the back and a big driveway in the front. They have a motor home and lots of cars. But even so, even with all that parking, they still, as was pointed out, there's still is cars parked there on the side, on this narrower street. Um, my other um, concern is for the environment. I have brought along the picture of the house that you were talking about, the sweet little house on Calvin. Um, it was built in 1993. It's a beautiful looking house. Um, and so while I'm recycling my paper and my greens at my house, this house will be going to a landfill. And I just think we're such a wasteful society. We're tearing down this one house so we can squeeze in three little houses. And you know, they're talking about saving some trees on the lot, but how many trees are being taken away? There's three houses. They're going to save the Heritage House from 1960s, but there's a house at 810 that they're going to knock down, and then there's a house on Calvin, 811. So you can leave the trees, but the houses are 
being wasted. Um, and they're only 20 to 25 years old. They were built in 1993 and 1995. So um, I feel a little bit um, uneasy thinking that um, a developer can come in and things can be changed overnight and for whose benefit? Because it certainly won't be a benefit to the residents of Jarvis Street and McIntosh and Hibbard and Spring. Um, it's these proposed Houses are not close to the SkyTrain, and it's not in the Perquitlam area that is designated for multifamily type homes. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Councillor Hodge? Yes, uh, just a, a question for staff about uh, traffic and, and parking. Um, the, the width now, uh, I can't remember if it's this resident or the resident before, uh, mentioned that McIntosh is uh, not as wide as Porter, so maybe you just sort of walk me through the, uh, the street hierarchy here. Is one a, a collector or are they both residential to different standards? So just uh, I see, see our engineering department uh, getting ready to, uh, to answer so we can get some information, please. Yes, through the chair, um, both McIntosh and Kelvin are local roads. Uh, they're in a 20 meter right of way, so there'll be 8.5 meter width of, of pavement curb to curb. And I believe Porter would be a collector road, a wider actual. Okay, curb. so that's why that's why Porter is it is designated collector. And sorry, what is what is Porter McIntosh is 8.5? Uh, the typical local road is 8.5 meters wide. Yes. And so it is, it is not narrower than other residential roads. That's the standard width for residential? Uh, I, I believe so. I, I'm not sure exactly what the width of the existing road is, but I suspect it's 8.5. Okay. And on an 8.5, we would allow parking on both sides? Correct. Okay. And then in this case, uh, is, are there any planned uh, intersection improvements or anything at this time? We heard some concerns about traffic in and out and other things. Is this anything in the near future planned for this, this intersection? Uh, through the chair, I'm, I'm not aware of any plans to improve the intersection at McIntosh. Okay, and, uh, and just to, uh, to uh, the resident who spoke about the, uh, the house demolition, um, it's, uh, we've seen houses come down even, uh, even to replace with, within the same zoning housing coming down and uh, we are working to uh, reduce waste going to, uh, to landfill. So any demolition would uh, have to go through, uh, through that process of, uh, of source sep of material separation and other things. So it's not straight to the landfill. Is that, I believe that's correct. Engineering, I think there are, there are bylaws and, and things on, on demolition. I know certain cities have higher standards and we've, we've talked about it, but I believe at this point there, there is some, uh, some uh, recycling or diversion that takes place. Uh, through the chair, that's correct. The, the Metro Vancouver, the, they, they, they require proper recycling of, of demolitions. I say that as somebody who's on that committee. I just wasn't sure where, where we fit in, but we, we at least meet the minimum standards. So, good. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other speakers to this item? Okay. I am Gord Carter. I live at 876. You just met my wife a few minutes ago. Uh, I've got some concerns as well. Uh, one is uh, Como Lake is really a highway, it's not a street. Most cars go to 80 to 90k down that street at any given time. It is not a, a safe road as it is, and it's never, uh, I've never seen a cop on it ever, other than at the bottom of the hill so they can catch it in the speed trap. I do want to ask a question in regards to there's an easement right now in between where the remnant lot would be. I'm wondering if that easement's going to be there uh, when they decide to, de whatever the decision is to, de uh, to develop the property. I also got some concerns about the fantastic. Uh, evergreen trees that are on that property. I don't know if you've been there or not. Um, if they want to tear down houses, I think it'd be a better idea just to make it a park than it would be to uh, do the developing. But it, I'd uh, digress here. And since it might as well say that if you're going to rezone it, please leave it just the way it is. Um, going to an R3, putting extra, pro extra cars in the roads is not a great idea. A good example is I, just go over to Blue Mountain Street, uh, one block over from Calvin Street. Look at that first block in between Coma Lake and uh, and uh, what's the street there, I can't remember. 
Spence, Thanks. try and get through there when both cars are on both sides of the road and it's a very busy street, Blue Mountain, you're going to have the same issue on, on McIntosh as well. And it's not safe there. Cars are zipping down there and it's not a great area to do that. I understand that you want the density, I understand that. But realistically, what you're doing is you're doing major damage to a neighborhood that I've lived in for 34 years. And I'd like to stay there for another 34 years. Thank you very much. Thank you. You want to speak? Good evening. Good evening. My name is George DeJesus. I live at 1055 Smith Avenue. I know it's not in the area of this RS3 development that's going through, but I was a previous resident of 844 Porter, and we moved out of the area because of Harborview. The amount of traffic that flies up and down Harborview for parents that are so lazy to get their kids out of bed at 8.15, feed them breakfast so that they can make it to school at 9 o'clock is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Okay? We used to have a 30K sign at Smallwood and Porter, and now you guys have moved it all the way down to the very end. Like it's three houses from the school. What good is that? These parents are doing 100K down the road. I even had one time a parent that actually lives behind me on Cornell that was flying down the street last day of school four times with his kid in the back seat of a car that doesn't even have a seat convertible. I'm just going to interrupt you for a second. This public hearing is about land use. Right. So if you could just keep your comments on that. So we want to keep this area pristine. I also own a property on 952 Macintosh. Now, I want to know from Mr. McIntyre, what is a sliver that they're going to take off that remnant lot? What is the size of a sliver? Is it two inches, five feet, 10 feet? I developed a property, another one that I have is I developed a property in Vancouver. When I went to develop my property that I purchased in 1980, in 2007 is when I developed the property, I went to city and they put a lane, a lane designation on my property. Nothing on land titles. So if the sliver yeah. is gonna to be taken today, then we want lane designation put onto that property so that we can see exactly how much lane is gonna be there. Mr. McIntyre, did you have a comment on that? Or Mr. Denny? Uh, through the chair, the, the width of the portion of the remnant lot, or, or that lot, 804 McIntosh Street, that will be involved for the, the subdivision is 2.7 meters wide. Thank you. And I understand that we, the city is trying to eliminate uh, off of Comb Lake driveways onto this property. If they decide to put a laneway, do not make it a through laneway. Either they enter from Calvin or Macintosh, but do not make it through to Calvin. Because as spoke before, the parents that are on the west side of Blue Mountain, they'll take shortcut Calvin through this laneway onto Macintosh, Hibbard, and then fly down Porter. That's all. Thank you. Uh, any other speakers? Yeah, okay, good. Good evening. Hello, my name is Cheryl Spriggs. I live at 1003 Calvin Street on the very, very north end. Uh, my daughter Janine spoke earlier with regards to seeing the signs torn down, etc. Uh, a lot of points have been made tonight. I am adamantly against anything that's going to be more than RS1. Um, one thing that hasn't been brought up is regarding all the traffic concerns that have been made. Our house is on the very north end of Kelvin, the other end of Kelvin that we're talking about, it's all, it's a, it's completely dead end on both ends. Everybody has to go through Spence Street or they have to go through Leland. Both of those streets now, because of some of the humongous uh, properties that have been built, 
especially this past winter that we had that was pretty pretty horrific with snow, you could not get down Leland Street. You couldn't. You could barely get down Spence Street. At least you had a little bit more room to hopefully get your car steered down that, that uh, road. So both of those sides are cluttered with uh, tenant uh, parking, and uh, that isn't acceptable. Below Blue Mountain Street, all the way down to Miller Park, so all of those streets down there, so you're talking Spence, you're talking... Uh, Kinzac, Stardale, all of those houses that are there, there's only one way out and that is through um, Blue Mountain Street and including the dentist office on the corner of Blue Mountain and Coma Lake and a karate studio underneath or whatever it is now, I don't know. Um, everybody that's all the way down to Miller Park on our side has to come out through Blue Mountain. So to start adding all of these properties there, particularly if they are multifamily situations or huge lots that uh, are larger lots that are going to have uh, two or three uh, suites in them or whatever they're doing now, um, it's unacceptable. There's going to be a complete mess. It's already a mess now. It's only going to get worse. So for me, I'm thrilled to be on the north end. I somewhat avoid most of it, but every day coming in and out tonight myself, just getting trying to get out to come to here at 7 o'clock or 10 to 7 at night, stood there for six cars coming through that light on Como Lake. And you can't go around, there's cars parked on both sides. And that's just me, one person at 10 to 7 at night trying to get out of my community to come to this meeting. So I think that that has to be taken into effect or account as well as all of those properties that are all the way down to Miller Park. And there's a lot of homes down there. I can't remember the one street's name. Um, but anyway, it's, it's all the way from that dental office on the corner all the way to the ravine. And, uh, that's a, that's a lot of people. Thank you very much. Councilor Zarillo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had a question. Um, I made a note that the tenants parking is an issue and I just wanted to understand if you believe or know that there's multiple suites in some of these larger... Well, I toured all those houses when they were all open houses. It's a, a passion of mine, an interest of mine, so I was in every one of them. And I know for a fact there's more than one, two, and one house, three suites. For sure, there's definitely not parking made available for those people. Um, that that should be a, a, maybe a separate topic, but that should be part of the whole thing. If you're going to build a big house like that, you've got to provide parking. And Leland Street, I know my other neighbor Gordon Clay. I'm surprised he's not here tonight. Um, has been to several meetings and been to the city several times to complain about his street, which is Leland. And you know, just the street itself is a mess. It's got potholes, sinkholes, everything everywhere. And now we've got two sets of cars, one on either side parking all the way down. So you can't in the wintertime get down there. So that leaves me on the very north end to go all the way down Kelvin, past some of the monster homes, turn down Spence Street, down to Blue Mountain, which is then all the people coming from Miller Park up to get out that same way. And, you know, we all travel to work pretty much at the same time. So, um, you know, there's got to be some consideration made for the roadways. I think it's, I've been there 24 years. I think it was the first 23 years before we saw a sidewalk put down Blue Mountain, which was desperately needed. And on Kelvin, there's only uh, partial sidewalks. If you're a newer home, you've had to develop that part of your property. But lots of old houses along there that don't have them. So it's not even safe to walk a dog. So that's, uh, that's a concern. Well, thank you for that, because it is one of the things we struggle with here, like on the RS1, you get a, a larger house with multiple suites, which aren't allowed in our city, or do you, you try to get a smaller lot, which creates a smaller house, which at least doesn't allow for multiple. So it's a, it's a, it's a difficult one, but thank you for, uh, for that input. That was important. Thank you. Thank you. And you'll be next. Madam Chair, Good evening. Uh, councillors, Lucien Kempo, 988 Kinsack Street, there for 46 years. Things have really improved in our area. My background is 35 years with Provincial Parks as District Manager for the Lower Mainland, and I did 15 years of consulting for the GVRD Parks. I'm quite concerned of the six lots. Uh, I've, I've cruised the area uh, with the big trees. There's, I think, there's seven that are over 100 years old. There's 20 trees altogether. Should these six lots go ahead, then the lot that uh, the piece of property that faces Coma Lake, there's another half a dozen big trees there too. So it doesn't matter what they're ever going to do, what they're going to do with that area. The trees will also have to be removed. The other thing is that right now we have two schools in our area that are very close: Miller Park and Banting. Miller Park has just been upgraded for several, several million dollars, and now we have a brand new 
school being built at Banting. As it sits today, there's going to need eight portables to handle the children because the provincial government and the school board are not in sync. So I would just like to bring that to the attention of council that it's nice to have more homes, smaller homes for smaller families, but we have to look at the facilities that would be afforded to, to these children. Thank you. Thank you. Any other speakers to this item? Okay, come on down. Oh, sorry, sir, I guess you'll be next. Sorry, I saw her first. Sorry. What about that? Hi, I'm Hi. Christina Barbosa, 95 Jarvis Street. Um, my main concern is, uh, like everyone else, uh, all of the other concerns, um, my husband and I moved into the area 14 years ago, and like I think most of the people here um, came to the area because of what it is, um, because we wanted to raise a family in this area where we could have a nice backyard for our children, nice, nice safe place for our children to play. Now my children are teenagers, and they walk from the bus every day along these streets, and I don't want more traffic there, obviously. Um, I understand the need for densification, and I understand the need for affordability, but there are places for that at Coquitlam, at Town Centre, uh, in various places, even along Austin Corridor, but this is not the place for it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, your turn. Good evening. My name is Alan Lawrence. I live at 828 McIntosh Street. And I promise not to talk about traffic, Councillor <laughs> Wilson. Uh, the previous lady kind of stole my thunder because I'd just like to remind everybody that when we talk about densification, there's a BLNP plan down at Burkwitlam that is presenting nine to 10,000 homes for people. These are start a home area. The only reason for densification that we are here tonight is a greedy developer that's trying to make the most out of an existing lot. There is no other reason for doing this. This is an area that people aspire to live in, and I'm one of them. Councillor Hodge, you mentioned recycling. Yes, that's very true. And I'm sure there's a lot of homes that came down in the Burquitlam area in the interest of that high density as the last lady says, this, I'm sorry, is not the place. I've lived there for 19 years, and I will do everything I can to maintain my home. Thank you. Thank you. Any other speakers? Hello there. Hi, everyone. Uh, Ian Suter, 2821 Windrum. Thanks for this wonderful event. Uh, public hearing. I'm very excited to learn about this community. I don't know it particularly very well as I'm still learning my way around Coquitlam, but it's does not. this is not a, an unusual problem for the Lower Mainland and even it's starting to happen out in the Fraser Valley where I'm from originally. Um, I think densification is a great idea. I know this is a reality we're having to face both as young people and as developing communities that are grappling with um, population influx. Um, this is clearly going to be a big trouble for the developer because they obviously want to make the most most out of their money here or out of the land that they've got. But we've got a whole community that we have to take care of here, and I think that really should be our our overarching goal as uh, cities. So looking at all these people, that's a very cohesive uh, community. It looks like and everyone's knows each other more or less well, so they've got a good sense of the area out there, and they sound pretty. Uh, pretty um, unanimous, so they've reached consensus on this idea. Um, my, the, what I, as someone who doesn't live in this area, I look at this and say, where is densification needed? We've got these fabulous new transit hubs. We've got um, the 10 years mayor plan that's coming in that the new government, the new provincial government's pushing through. We've got fabulous new uh, minister of housing who lives in our area even, and I know that she's on board with densification in the right areas as well. Um, 
I think we've got a really prime opportunity to work both with developers and with the government here, because it looks like everyone wants to um, get the boat, get the most out of these communities here. Mostly, it's just what doesn't make sense to me on an individual case, because this is not on a major um, transit corridor. We've got lots of areas where we could do densification, and I think that should be sort of the longer goal of city council is looking at the, the big OCP and say, well, we've got all this new stuff in here. Well, this is this, this, like, let's look at this neighborhood and say, that area needs to be densified because it's within a certain distance of the SkyTrain or the rapid transit lines. Um, and having driven down Como Lake uh, many times, I, I'm surprised, I would be very surprised if anyone would be comfortable pulling a bus over there, much less a car. Um, but I, I would leave that to the community residents to know best. But yeah, just looking at this um, from arm's length, I would just wonder why we would not be looking for de further densification in a place that makes sense rather than one that doesn't really have any um, pre-existing transit. Unless, of course, we were going to make lots of excuses for people to not use their cars in that area and provide transit for them. But uh, that's a whole other can of worms. Just my thoughts. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Are there any other speaker, other speakers to this item? Hmm? There, oh, here we go. Good evening. My name is Merlin Reeve. I live at 940 Macintosh. I totally oppose this, and I'll tell you why. Everybody's been talking about traffic all night. Well, I'm going to add to it. Again, you're coming north, or sorry, you are coming east on Como Lake and you turn into McIntosh, there's somebody parked at 801, right there. So you're going to run into them. That's for starters. Now you go down a little bit farther, now you have three more units in there. Where are those people parking? You got two cars, you got four cars per unit. Are they going to park on the road? Who's going to stop them? Is there going to be a bylaw? This creates a whole bunch of trouble here. I think there's just money involved in this, but at any rate, I'm not even going to get into that. Now, as some people said, the speed limit. Why isn't there speed limit posted in that neighborhood? That's a quiet neighborhood. If you guys ever hopped in your car and drove through it, you'd know what we mean. It's a nice neighborhood. But you know what? There's kids, and that's the last thing we need, is some mom with their kid turning in there and running into a parked car. That's, that's right there in McIntosh. I'm sorry, that is one of the biggest things. I know we need affordable housing, but guys, there's gotta be a better way, okay? So I want you to really think this through, right? All right, thank you. Thank you. Are there any other speakers to this item? Are there any other speakers to this item? Okay. Or have you spoken before? Uh, I can speak to that. Okay. There's no other speakers. Yeah. Okay. Welcome back. It's Ian McCaskill again from 949 Jarvis. I've been in the neighborhood 34 years, and um, I, I somehow feel that my message might not have got through because there was no cross examination on the key points. But I, I wanted to add an additional point that I didn't mention. People talk about densification as a way of making affordable housing. Now, get real about that in our neighborhood. It's not, th this is not a development where changing the, the, the um, zoning from RS1 to RS3 will create any amount of affordable housing. Affordable housing will be created by some other um, method and I, I do implore you to think carefully about the precedent of uh, moving the designation in that neighborhood from RS1 to RS3. It's a precedent, and uh, there's, many, um, uh, there's many houses that are contiguous that would be just right for the kind of development that is proposed in, uh, by this action, and it will be very difficult for council to go back and say no to a subsequent development after they've approved this. 
um, I really urge you to think carefully about the precedent that's established if you allow this zoning uh, um, to be uh, changed from RS1 to RS3 on this particular initiative. It will just be the beginning of the end of the neighborhood that everybody has talked about valuing. And so that's the additional thing I'd like to say. Thank you for hearing me, and good night. Thank you. Oh, Councilor Zarello? I have a quick question, and I, I wanted to make the comment earlier that I'm, I'm really pleased to see that the residents have gotten together and they have a, an association, and I, I hope that, they, that the association registers with the city and continues to be involved. Um, I wanted to say that. But I did want to ask, and maybe you can represent the voices around you, what is the... What is the vision? If this remains an RS1, what is the vision for the community um, for these lots? Four lots of RS1, that would be 7,000 are okay? Like, what is the vision that the, the community would like to see for this, this, this I, corner here? I, I honestly can't speak for the community, and I don't actually think community associations can speak for the community. They speak for collections of people within the community. But what, what uh, my vision is for the neighborhood is to retain in the in that in the area the zoning area the rs1 designation just leave it as it is allow developers to develop properties but don't enable developers to to accumulate properties in order to um in order to up zone to to a more uh, dense development it doesn't do anything in the public pur purpose it's just purely a, a way of uh, developers making money and degrading the character of an existing neighborhood. So um, there are places for where densification should occur, closer to the uh, uh, um, uh, Evergreen Line and, and so forth, and on bus, bus hubs and near parks and near, near shopping centers and the like. Um, but our particular neighborhood, I think, um, will, as the market has shown in the last couple of years, it will retain its best value and highest use in an RS1 designation. That's good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other speakers on this item? Are there any other speakers on this item? Okay, okay welcome back. Yes, thank you for hearing me again. I would like to, I'm Graham Hung, uh, as I mentioned just now. I, I would like to reiterate what the previous speaker had mentioned, that if this RS3 zoning goes through, what we will see in future is uh, multiple land assemblies. You will see multiple signs on adjacent lots in the future in quiet neighborhoods like this. And it's all, it doesn't create affordable housing. It creates a housing mess, mess I, would, I would rather put it that way. So uh, that's all I want to emphasize. There will be multiple land assemblies. As one sees when you drive down Broadway, can be, and, 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 and uh, the, the Vancouver neighborhoods. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other speakers to this item? Do you have something new to say? Yes, I do. Okay. Go now, ahead. everybody's talked about a plan that they've never gave us, right? Me as a homeowner, if I want to put an addition on my home, do I not have to come up with a drawing and a permit and a value? of each addition or whatever I do to my home? Yes, you do. When I, I put two additions on my home, I had to come up with what the estimated value was of what it was going to cost me. Now, and I had to come up with a drawing. Now, these guys haven't come up with anything, which is not fair to your basic citizen, number one. Number two is, so if this RS3 goes through, you got six homes, density, how much are each one of those going to cost for someone to buy? Has that been added up yet? Has that been said? No. 
You know, has anybody set a value on each? Right now, tonight, we're talking about land use. I know, I know. But that's, 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 if, if it's, if it's, if, if they're talking about even low income housing, is it? So that's all got to be looked at, too. Because if you put one house on each one of them in that neighborhood, they're going for two and a half million. So where there's three, where there's three townhouses, whatever, that lot would be a one house, two and a half million. So you do the math of what they're getting. They charge in a million a piece, so now that's three million. Something. And like I much. said, more people. Any other speakers to this item? Oh, sorry, Councillor Wilson. Just wanted to uh, clarify with staff that uh, in a rezoning, um, we don't require, not allowed to ask for um, building plans and values that would all come when the building permit is applied for. Is that correct? Mr. McIntyre? Uh, through the chair, yes, that's correct. Um, rezoning is uh, land use and density. Um, when there's a multifamily or commercial, sometimes there's illustrations that go along with the development permit, but for a single family, no, there's not. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Hello. Hi. Uh, Gary Hansen, 1010 Como Lake Avenue. I'm going to keep it real short and sweet because I came straight from work and I'm starving. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I'd just be really disappointed if it got rezoned. It would cheapen the neighborhood and... I've lived there for 35 years now, and it would be a shame. So that's all. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Are there any other speakers to this item? You have something new? Uh, I'm Lena Shiliano. I live on 911 Jarvis. And I'd like to say that I'm actually uh, born and raised in Vancouver, and I lived on a 33 foot lot for until I got married and moved away. The reason, I'm, I cannot tell you how it felt to live cramped on that lot with like, you know, tenants upstairs and renters on this side and renters on that side. It was my sole goal to go and bring my family, get married, move my family to a neighborhood where we had room. We didn't have to live on top of each other and they, the kids could play in the backyard, play tennis or do whatever, play bocce ball, whatever they wanted. That was my sole goal. I was fortunate enough to learn about the neighborhoods, and I'll be honest with you, I, I don't want to really admit this, but I stopped that area for a long time because I knew it was an area that had um, a good neighborhood, good families, um, they had the room, and I was really looking forward to like, you know, bringing my family into this new area. I feel like when you, you do this, you do the rezoning, we're going back in time. I'm going back to Vancouver where I was like running away from, and and I'm, I would be really sad to see the, the rezoning changed and a precedent sent for, uh, set for the rest of the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, are there any other speakers to this item? Are there any other speakers to this item? Third and final time, are there any other speakers to this item? Okay. Good evening. Um, Ron Kimoto, uh, 871 Jarvis Street. I waited for the very last moment for a reason. And if you forgive me, I've been, haven't been in a lecture hall or given a talk at a conference in 16 years, so I'm nervous as heck. So if I may, I'm one of the uh, canvassers that went around the neighborhood. And as Ron has said, we had collected at least 330 names of people that were opposed to this proposal. And many are here today. But one thing I've noticed is an absence. The developer is not here. And we've been asking questions and we've had uh, questions that you've asked, we would like to ask, but he's not here to give his side of the story, to defend his ideas, to give his proposals. If I can, I'm going to have to read this. Our neighborhood has responded overwhelmingly uh, in opposition to rezoning the lots on Macintosh from any designation other than RS1. Uh, you as council members have a delicate balance because you have to balance the wishes of the electorate, us, 
with fiscal responsibilities. Uh, if one were not familiar with numbers, you could argue that only one neighborhood, ours, is opposed to this rezoning pro uh, uh, proposition. And that would be an inaccurate uh, interpretation of the numbers. Ours is a typical neighborhood, and if a referendum were to be held on the direction Coquitlam Co 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 residents would like to see the neighborhood progress, the results would be similar throughout probably all the communities, and they would side with us. There are corridors near SkyTrain stations that have condos and townhouses and or higher density. We are not anywhere close to any such stations and would prefer the peace and quiet of a typical suburban neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other speakers to this item? Are there any other speakers to this item? Okay, third and final time, are there any other speakers to this item? Seeing no other speakers, I declare this item closed. Thank you all very much. Mr. Clerk? Oh, it just, just got hit. Sorry about that, Councilor Zorro. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I didn't so, see I'm it. sorry, yeah, no worries. Um, I, I just want to check with um, uh, staff. Is it so that the uh, proponent is, is, is not present? Mr. Uh, Denny? Through the chair, I do believe the applicant is here. I don't think it's, it's uh, the, the proponent doesn't have to speak, but I think it's important for the group to know that they have come to the public hearing to hear the thoughts of the community. Thank you for bringing it up. Okay, thank you. Mr. Clerk. And so um, staff will go, uh, or a counselor will go collect them. From Oh, he fell asleep. Yes, he ate all the Chinese food. Okay. Um, <laughs> Please be reminded that we will be making our decision at the council meeting following tonight's public hearing. Uh, we're recommending, recommending, recommending second and third reading, not fourth and final. No, just, so, I just want you to know. Fourth and final. Second and third. Not today. Second and third. Not fourth and final. So you're not making a decision. Okay. You're going to talk a little against the recommendations of the planning department. <laughs> I just wanted you to be aware. I was just reminding everyone that. Not fourth and final. So if they go fourth and final, they're going against. Okay, next, next item. item. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, next item, item three, is an application to amend C. Coquitlam zoning bylaw in order to rezone the property at 218 Blue Mountain Street from C2 General Commercial to C5 Community Commercial. This is bylaw number 4789. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jeff Denny. I'm going to present. Um, this is the Millard Bill's first tower. Is that this one? That is correct. So I'm going to recuse myself from the discussion because, unfortunately, um, I travel that way every day almost for the last year, and I feel that I've been unduly lobbied, and I don't feel that I can sit in and, and make a, 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 a listen to it not having previous been, been lobbied. So I'm going to recuse myself. And I think it's unfortunate. That, that happened, but thank you. Okay. Okay. Start again. Uh, my name is Jeff Denny. Uh, I'm here to present item three, which is a proposed rezoning for the properties located at 218 Blue Mountain Street and 837 Low Heat Highway. The subject site is located at the corner of Low Heat Highway and Blue Mountain Street. It consists of two sites. Sorry. It consists of two lots. One lot is uh, zoned C5 Community Commercial, and the other lot is zoned C2 General Commercial. The surrounding land, land uses uh, generally consist of multifamily and ground-oriented housing, as well as commercial and office space. 
The site is located in the Maillardville neighborhood plan. It's designated neighborhood center within that plan. The lands to the north are designated medium density apartment residential, and the area to the south is designated service commercial. The applicant is proposing to rezone 218 Blue Mountain Street from C2 commercial zone to C5 community commercial zone and consolidate the two subject lots in order to construct a mixed use 21 story tower and townhouses on the subject site. The applicant will provide 5.3 meters of road dedication along Blue Mountain Street to allow for future road widening. The proposal is consistent with the neighborhood center designation in the Maillardville neighborhood plan. On the left is the proposed site plan and on the right is a proposed rendering of the tower. The site is accessed off Roderick Avenue. There's an internal auto court that leads to an underground parking facility with four levels of underground parking and 239 parking spaces. Eight townhouse units are proposed fronting Roderick Avenue. Uh, each unit is about three stories in height and has three bedrooms. A two-story podium is proposed fronting Low Heed Highway. It consists of four ground floor commercial retail units and second level or office space on the second level. A small publicly accessible plaza is located adjacent is proposed adjacent one of the commercial retail units and it will be programmed with seating and tables. And the tower itself is a 21 story tower and it is located in the southeast portion of the site and it's slightly set back from the street wall. Staff recommend that council give second and third readings to bylaw number 4789 2017. Thank you. Councilor Reed. Thank you. Through to staff, um, it mentioned shadowing here, and it's mentioned that it was brought up at the uh, public meeting, but um, what were the results of it, Mr. McIntyre or whomever? <laughs> Mr. Denny? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Reed, the, it is a slope. Can I confirm? It is a slope. Correct. It is going a, down. So, yeah, yeah. how much higher then is the tower than what's on the top of the slope? And we don't have that exact information, but the applicant did uh, locate the tower in the southeast corner to try to minimize the impacts of, of shadowing on the uh, the existing housing to the north of the site. That's very nice. But what are the impacts? The applicant did provide a shadowing study. Do I have it? Because I haven't seen it if I do. Did you see it, Brent? Oh, from memory, do you remember? Pardon? Sorry, upside down. There we go. Okay, if it's here, I'll look at it and I'll ask more questions later. Thank you. I can't see it. Okay, uh, we have a couple of registered speakers. The first one is uh, Mr. Al Johnson from DA Architects and Planners. Good evening. Hello, Madam Chair, Council. My name is Al Johnson. I'm with DA Architects and Planners, and we are the uh, designers of this particular project. And I thought I would just take a few minutes and give you an overall, just a little bit of enlightenment as to what the, um, the architectural character is and some of the, the characteristics of the, the project itself. 
Um, the image you see in front of you right now really shows the proximity is there a point? Uh, the, the image you see here shows the alignment of um, the location of the tower on the southwest corner. We've got... There is no pointer. Okay. So, the corner of uh, Lougheed Highway and, and Roderick Avenue. You can see the overall character of the, the project, which involves, as uh, uh, city staff was mentioning, uh, to mixed-use development with commercial on the uh, ground level. Um, on the, uh, the ground level with offices above on the second floor, townhouses facing north and the, the tower above. You'll notice by looking at this particular image that there is a rooftop garden on the upper uh, portion of the tower. Let's go to the next image. This shows some of the uh, inspiration for the project, which is kind of a contemporary aesthetic, which speaks really to some of the, the French imagery, but in a contemporary way. The rooftop element itself uh, is, is inspired by a mansard roof. There's an opportunity to create a, a lantern on the horizon. This will be, as mentioned, the, the first tower in the um, Lardville area on the far west side. You can see the south-facing south elevation, a series of uh, deep balconies which provide abundant open space. And this rooftop area right now is for the shared use of people in the uh, development itself. Close to the grade, You'll see the ground level uh, retail with the office on the second floor. The objective is to create a kind of a thin profile, but also a different perspective as you experience the project from different sides. This image also shows really the steep sloping side of uh, Blue Mountain as it slopes from Roderick down to uh, low heat. Zeroing in on some of the characteristics, uh, there is an ample setback along low heat highway. And with that, you can see the individual storefronts, which would be the, the retail shops themselves. The white canopy that you see is the main entry to what will be the uh, entry lobby to the second floor commercial, about 7,000 square feet. And on top of that podium, you see some of the outdoor space that's allocated to the residents in the uh, project itself. Uh, you can see, start to see some of the materials that are being used in the project. There's stone, high quality stone and uh, uh, metal panels. This corner view briefly shows the open plaza at the corner of Lougheed and Blue Mountain. With that again, the corner commercial opening onto that and the terrace landscape, which takes you up towards um, past the residential lobby. This is the main lobby of the residential tower itself. There's a staircase then parallel to a sloping ramp. And you can see these stone clad planters, which again create a buffer in anticipation for the eventual widening of uh, Blue Mountain itself, if that day ever comes. The layering of landscape is an important component of the, the massing and the character of their project, so that's been quite uh, extensive. And you can see also some of the, the signage that's being developed uh, in, to play on the characteristics of uh, the Millardville neighborhood and some of the, uh, the heritage guidelines. The overview looking from the uh, southeast shows the townhouses fronting onto Roderick. The access for the development, as uh, city staff mentioned, is off Roderick, and there's an auto court. Zeroing in on that a little bit. Traffic will come in off Roderick. The loading bays and everything will be fully concealed from view from neighbors, and then that'll be access to a secondary lobby, which is the, the canopy there, and that is the lobby to the residential development itself. So there's a front street lobby as well as a private port cochere type of lobby. And again, the, the townhouses with the, the sloped roofs and roof access. Another view showing the, the prominent corner of Roderick and uh, Blue Mountain and the extensive terracing and landscaping which will uh, create a buffer. And the intent of this, this massing here really is to relate in more of a uh, mid-rise scale to the residential development across the street as a buffer. And that's just a brief overview of the architectural character. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Marston. Thank you. Uh, so just to clarify, the entrance for parking will be on the north side of the building? That's right. Okay. And the 
diagram we've got up here right now shows the south side, which would show the entranceway to the second floor offices? Yes, that's correct. So there's obviously some other form of access to those second points. I, I'm challenged to see people making that long trek around the corner to access the building. Yeah, all, all uh, commercial parking as well as residential parking will come through this access point into the uh, Port Couchere drop off and then they go down into a designated commercial parking area okay. and there's direct access from that commercial parking into a shared lobby. So you've got your street access for your commercial as well as an internal connection. So you're catering both to pedestrians but as well acknowledging the fact that people are going to arrive in their cars. All right, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next registered speaker is a Mr. Dadwall of 235 Blue Mountain Street. Good evening. I want to keep this simple. I moved from Vancouver to Coquitlam to get away from the rat race. <laughs> but now I live at 235 Blue Mountain. This tower it doesn't go with the neighborhood. There is no t such tavern in this neighborhood. The closest one, I think, is Lloyd, Lloyd Mall. I think it's about two kilometers away. The other one, I think, is higher up Austin and Blue Mountain, I think, on the corner. So basically, my que question is, I posed to this project was, number one is the traffic in the neighborhood. I, I live in the neighborhood. The last five years, I know how much noise night time. You can't sleep at night time. There's so much traffic. <clears throat> the main concern is the traffic I have. And the, the the other one, I don't think it's really fair to the other complexes behind the you know the they all low rises. They're gonna block the view for everybody. You know the if you look at the number forty. I think number A on the, if I, if I, yeah, 40 on the bottom side, on the other side, and the 827 Roderick. And there's another one going up on, I think, on Gauthier Street, another low rise. So it's going to block all the view. Plus, it's going to block the view from my house as well, you know. So whatever little view I have is going to be gone. I can't see my Portello Bridge anymore, see the traffic. <laughs> So that is my main concern, it's the traffic, and plus it doesn't go over the neighborhood. Because if you look around, it's all low, low rises in that neighborhood. I think it's about four or five in that, in that close area. So that, that's my main concern. Other than that, is I don't have any other complaint. You say high density, I have nothing against high density. But I went to the open show, open house, the house prices for one bedroom, I think, is starting like 650000 So what's the affordability? 700000 800000 900000 So is, there is no affordability on these, you know. Affordability for young people it should be like 200000 300000 You know, this is going to have like 100, it's a 21-story building, 147 units, plus eight another, another townhouses. So the traffic is going to be the number one problem. That, that's my main concern, the traffic, okay? But the, there is no affordability. I already went to that open house. It, the house is like 800000 900000 million dollars. So there is no affordability. Forget about that part. <laughs> okay? So okay. that's it. Um, did you have questions for him? Yes. If you could stay up at the... There's a couple of um, speakers for you. Um, Councillor Wilson. Thank you very much for coming. Yeah, thank you. And and giving us your concerns. Do you have any suggestions on how we can create uh, two hundred thousand uh, dollar condos? No, no, no. I didn't say create. I said with everybody talk about affordability, right? I say there is no affordability anymore, right? <laughs> well, the challenge we have in Metro Vancouver is everybody's got a different uh, idea of what affordable is, right? Yeah, and yeah. and definitely these condominiums are not. Um, geared towards low-income families. These are market uh, condos. Yeah. Um, and so they're affordable for some people, but definitely not affordable for 
for others. And so the, yeah, because I've been hearing all, all night here. I've been waiting. To, everybody has hours. different I've been different waiting definitions. For affordability, right? Affordability. So there is no affordability here. Okay. Right? I mean, the, earlier, you know, the, the project before those six lots, those houses are going to go for like two point five million dollars. I agree with that. People were here, right? They buy for like eight hundred thousand, nine hundred thousand. They're going to split into. Six Most of us weren't saying those houses. No, were no, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, right? No, I get I just, it. I get it. I'm just saying. Um, in terms of uh, the neighborhood plan in that area, I totally agree with you that right now towers don't fit into that neighborhood at all. Um, in terms of the the neighborhood plan, um, does that plan account for in the future uh, towers um, because of the proximity to the Braid SkyTrain station and, and the higher density in the area? Mr. Denny. Through the chair to Councillor Wilson, uh, yes, based on the neighborhood center designation, uh, there is potential for similar forms of development uh, in the area. So we're expecting probably three or four, potentially five more towers in that general vicinity. Through the chair, uh, there is potential for that, correct? I'm, I'm well, really sorry, another, but there's that. There's another lot just across from the street on the other side of where the tower is going on. Uh, 219 Blue Mountain is empty. They already had the survey done in March, I think, uh, May, maybe March, April. They're just waiting for this one to go through. So that's another one coming up very shortly because I talked to the surveyors that time. I asked them, what are you guys doing? He said, oh, we do surveyors doing the survey on 219 here. Well, and I, you know, yeah. I, I know it's very difficult, but there was yeah. a neighborhood planning process that took two years um, to do and it, it provided all kinds of consultation in the neighborhood. And the plan uh, that came out included towers. So if I remember correctly, when I moved to the neighborhood, they, there was a big plan to do the intersection in that area. So I don't know how they're going to, if they got approval from the provincial government, because you need a pro approval from the provincial government to put this tower up there. Because, because yep. if I know when I first moved in, there was a big plan to do the whole thing in that. Yep. That's all part of this uh, application. Part of this, yeah. that's part of this thing. Yeah. So basically, that's, that's all my main concern is. I, the traffic is going to be chaos because right now I'm, I know how much traffic in that because I come out, I live two, three, five, I have to go through Roderick or I have to go through Harris to make a left turn on Blue Mountain. The traffic coming down the hill from the higher up, you know, like the Austin, down the hill. Sometimes I have to wait three, four, five minutes just to make a left turn in the morning. It's getting worse and worse in that corner. You know, that corner is really already too, too much congestion. I think, like I mentioned earlier to another speaker, yeah. everybody says traffic in their neighborhood yeah, yeah. Is, is the worst. And I, well, totally, I, I, I no told I'm not being disrespectful, but no, no. traffic is very difficult there. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, it's... But shouldn't it's, they address the traffic problem first before they put these high-right towers? Um, uh, you know, I mean, that's the, part of the city plan too, right? Shouldn't I, they be... I don't want to get into a, a, a discussion about um, traffic um, with you right now because that we're talking about land use here. Um, I think, in general, the whole Metro Vancouver area is going to have to get used to more traffic. Yeah, yeah. Well, like I said, I, I have no problem if they put a low rise in there because when I first moved into the neighborhood, they was going to put a low rise in there. There was a big sign up there. I think it was already approved and ready to build, and then this, all of a sudden they just hold off for five years until they bought that property back, you know, the next door. Now they're going to put a 21-story tower up there, yep. you know. So, you know, this, this thing is not new, right? I've been in the neighborhood for six years. It was supposed to be a five-story low-rise. No, but like we've said, in the new neighborhood plan, it, it yeah. accounts for more towers in that yeah. area. And so, unfortunately, that's this is part of, of the plan. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, it's, Did you have well, that's, that's my main concern is the traffic. And there is, there is no such thing as affordability. When they say, I, I talked to that when I went to the open house. We, we said the, the, the six hundred fifty to 700000 no, I mean seven hundred dollars per square feet. We understand. That's how much profit they're making. Like you know, it doesn't cost seven hundred dollars to put to build. Do you have any other points about the land use? No, 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 no. I'm just saying okay. there is no such thing as affordability because question. you guys, everybody's saying high density is going to solve the problem, but it doesn't Thank solve you. the problem. The price is Thank going. <laughs> any other questions? Are there any other speakers to this item? So basically, I opposed to this project. I don't think it's a good because oh. it's going to block the view for lots of all the other people behind. Behind that is three, three people. So you're well over your five minutes, and we we heard no, you. So okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any other speakers to this item? Okay, come on up.
Good evening. Uh, my name's Sonia. I'm, oh, that's quite loud. Um, I uh, live uh, on Gautier Avenue, so the building the, where I face um, southeast, and so the building uh, the building is going to block my view. But it's not. It's not. That's not the point. Actually, I was listening to everybody, and everybody's talking about the one um, thing mostly. But I think, um, and if there is proposals to build more of these towers. I think education hasn't been considered at all. I teach, and um, there's a school right behind, just off Gautier Avenue. <clears throat> and, okay, yes, there's links to traffic and everything else, but I think that there's, it's very, very dangerous. I've been living in the area for 15 years now, and it's so dangerous in that area. I think I fear mostly that for, the, for the children in that area completely. I think that's one of the points that I don't feel is being considered. Being an educator, I suppose that's what comes in the forefront for me. Um, not only the monstrosity of the 21-storey building that doesn't fit here. So I don't know if that's it's probably, it's just a comment anyway at this yeah. point. For the record, do we need her exact address? You just said your street, you didn't say your address. The requirement for address is to the satisfaction of the chair. Okay. Oh, on the satisfaction. That's fine. Thank you. Are there any other speakers to this item? No, I've got a question. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Terry. Okay, Councillor O'Neill. Yes, thank you very much. And this is um, just to clarify. Um, um, I, the point was almost clarified with the last uh, with Councillor Wilson's questions, but I wanted to just confirm with the uh, with our staff. The present official community plan designation is neighborhood center, and there's no change under this rezoning. The present zoning is C2 general commercial and C5 community commercial, and the requested zoning is C5 community commercial. So if um, so the staff, um, uh, the question to staff is, if, if this rezoning does not, application does not go through, what can the applicant build on this without coming to us for a rezoning or redesignation application? Which already allowed, already been through all the processes, um, already permitted. What can, what's the maximum that the, uh, any developer could build on this lot? Mr. Denny? Through the chair, through the chair to Councillor O'Neill. Uh, the, the, the C5 zone does permit a tower format, um, but whether or not that could be achieved without consolidating with the C2 parcel um, isn't determined at this time because we haven't had a layout, but the C5 zone itself could permit a tower. Thank you very much. Okay, okay. you can come up now. Good evening. Um, I just want to say that I am in favor of the project. Just need your um, name and address. Sorry, Diana Amoroso, 414 Walker Street. Thank you. Um, I just, I'm a realtor actually in the Coquillam area, and although the, I don't know why we're talking about values, but Millardville is an area that should actually be revitalized. It is our oldest area of Coquillam, and I'd like to see growth in that neighborhood. And uh, as far as the traffic concerns, I think with the interchange, Brunette interchange, that will probably redirect traffic so that we will have a better flow in the area. So just basically, I just want to say that I am in favor of the project and hope to see it happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other speakers to this item? Are there any other speakers? Yep, come on up. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Kaori Kaomoto. My address is 888 Gothay Avenue. On the map here, I live right where that number 40 is, and I live in the southeast second floor. If this building were to be built with a tower, I would lose a lot of um, my view from my living room. I'd be basically looking into probably somebody's townhouse or um, the tower behind it. It would totally block my view of the golf course that I currently have now. Not only that, I will not get any sun um, in the winter months when it gets cold and I have to rely on my gas fireplace. 
Uh, not just that as well, as, uh, another point is um, the traffic. I know I don't want to talk about the traffic, but if you've been down Blue Mountain, you would notice that the intersection of Low Heat and Blue Mountain, because Low Heat Highway is such a busy street, uh, people going down Blue Mountain, it could take you maybe three or four lights just to get down that intersection, trying to get on to Brunette. And then you get to Brunette, and then that small intersection, maybe you can fit five cars trying to turn right to get onto the number one highway. So basically, with everybody accessing Roderick Avenue, that's just going to be a huge bottleneck. I read um, some of the proposals as well as to parking. Um, they've now proposed to decrease the amount of visitor parking, share it amongst residential visitor parking. But if they're going to build commercial, um, they're going to have things like a Starbucks there. That's just going to create havoc. Like people are going to be driving in and out of Roderick, um, you know, and I'm just concerned because I live right there. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other speakers to this item? Are there any other speakers to this item? something new to share with us okay my question is they should keep the same zoning they should not change it change it to c5 keep it to c2 for low density whatever that's my uh, say. thank you are there any other speakers to this item are there any other speakers to this item third and final time are there any other speakers to this item seeing no other speakers i declare this item closed Thank you, Madam Chair. I will just go collect uh, Councillor Zerillo. Madam Chair, the next item, item four, is an application to amend the zoning bylaw to rezone portions of the properties located at 3512 David Avenue, 3561 Gisleson Avenue, and 3510 and 3517 Burke Village Promenade from A3 Agricultural and Resource to RT2 Townhouse Residential and P5 Special Park. These are bylaws number 4773, 4774, and 4775. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of Council. My name is Natasha Locke. I'm a development planner here with the City. Item 4 is proposed zoning amendment bylaw numbers 4773, 4774, and 4775, 2017. It's located on portions of 3512 David Avenue, 3561 Gisselson Avenue, and 3510 and 3517 Burke Village Promenade. The subject lands are city owned and comprised of sub areas A, B, and C, located south of David Avenue, bounded by the non fish bearing Burke Mountain Creek to the west, Mitchell Street to the east, and adjacent to the future Partington Creek Neighborhood Center. The subject lands are currently zoned A3 Agricultural and Resource. Surrounding properties are zoned A3 Agricultural and Resource, RT2 Townhousing Residential. P5 Special Park, and RS7 Small Village Single Family Residential. The subject lands are designated Townhousing Residential and Environmentally Sensitive Area in the Partington Creek Neighborhood Plan. The portions of the subject lands designated Environmentally Sensitive Area are the streamside areas of Burke Mountain Creek. The applicant is proposing a rezoning from A3 Agricultural and Resource to RT2 Townhouse Residential to create three lots for future townhouse development and P5 Special Park to allow for the dedication and protection of portions of Brook Mountain Creek and the Streamside area and the completion of local trail connections. The total area proposed to be rezoned to RT2 is 7.78 hectares or 19.22 acres total and P5 is 1.03 hectares or 2.55 acres total. Staff have been made aware that the placing of the public hearing signs for this development application has caused some confusion in the community. 
Given the fact that the road network is not fully completed in the area, the signs had to be placed on existing road frontage as close to the subject property as possible. Staff recommend that Council grant second and third readings to bylaw numbers 4773, 4774, and 4775, 2017. Thank you. Are there any speakers to this item? Are there any speakers to this item? Third and final time? Oh, Councillor Zerlo? Yeah, through the chair, if I could just ask staff, this is um, looking for a townhouse zoning, and I wonder if I could just get an understanding of how the residential waste is dealt with um, in the townhouse uh, designations. And the reason I'm asking is obviously because of the wildlife and the, the bear problems that we have, and I uh, just want to understand if I could get clarification on how residential waste is handled in townhouse uh, complexes through the chair um, so this is just a application for rezoning there's no development permits being submitted with this application at this time development permits are to come in the future and those development permits will address any waste and recycling removal sure and and I totally understand that but this is for council to decide if they think this should be zoned townhouse and I just need a an understanding of um, how the waste is handled in townhouse zoning. I mean, obviously it's by complex, but I just want to understand how it's, what's the bylaw around what the, re what the residential waste uh, area needs to look like in a townhouse complex? And I understand we're not looking complex or complex right now, but we are saying we want to make townhouses there. So what is the waste pickup going to look like or what is the waste management going to look like in this area is kind of what I'm trying to get the understanding of. Mr. McIntyre? Uh, yes. <clears throat> Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, let me make a few remarks, and if I miss something, uh, I'm sure my colleague in the uh, engineering public works can speak to the solid and green waste. Um, as anyway, we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, not in the, you know, the rezoning uh, land use stage, but if in the end, if the uh, rezoning was to be approved and go through that development permit process and construction, all that development, um, as any residential unit in the city, uh, there's certain um, waste stream obligations on the on the on the resident solid waste. Recycling, green waste, um, and um, typically for multifamily, they would they would contract for those uh, uh, those pickup services. I believe the city's contractor uh, they will look at that, um, and they may extend that service to that that uh, site on a contract basis. But the um, each unit owner would be responsible for their own waste streams, um, and so then it would be the, uh, uh, the waste containers would, would need to be, um, as per our standard, uh, as the standard of the, the contractor, and they would need to be uh, kept on an individual unit basis. It, it tends to be on an individual unit uh, similar to single family. Okay, so um, thank you for that, and I might have more to say about that later, but thank you. That's wonderful. And thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other speakers to this item? Are there any other speakers to this item? Third and final time, are there any other speakers to this item? Seeing no other speakers, I declare this item closed. Mr. Clerk. Thank you, Madam Chair. Next item, item five, is an application to amend the citywide official community plan bylaw and the city of Coquitlam zoning bylaw to revise the land use designation of 1435, 1445, and 1455 Argyle Street, 3475, 3485, 3490, 3495, 3500, 3501, 3505, 3510, 3515, 3520, 3525, and 3530 Highland Drive, as well as rezone 1435, 1445, 1455 Argyle Street, and the properties at 3475, 3485, 3490, 3495, 3501, and 3505 Highland Drive. All that will be accomplished by bylaws numbers 4736 and 4737.
Good evening, Madam Chair and Council. I'm Jonathan Jackson, Development Planner of the City of Coquitlam, here to introduce item number five, uh, proposed OCP amendment uh, bylaw number 4736-2017 and zoning amendment bylaw number 4737-2017. I'm going to shorten this one. It's for addresses uh, 1435 to 1455 Argyle Street and 3475 to 3530 Highland Drive. Sorry. The subject properties are located uh, along Highland Drive between uh, east of Argyle Street and west of, west, uh, west of East Smiling Creek, and they include 15 properties within the subject lands. Uh, the existing zoning for the subject properties include RS2 Suburban Residential, RS11 Estate Single Family Residential, and P5 Special Park. The Properties are also within the Smiling Creek Neighborhood Plan within the Northeast Coquitlam Area Plan, and their land use designations as they are existing include large village single family, large single family, estate single family, environmentally sensitive area, and parks and natural open spaces. The applicant is proposing an official community plan amendment that would facilitate single family lots with a minimum lot sizes ranging from 340 meters squared or 3,660 square feet to 650 meters squared or 7,000 square feet, as well as the protection and enhancement of environmentally sensitive areas. This would include proposed land use designations of small village single family, large village single family, large single family, and environmentally sensitive areas. Additionally, the applicant is proposing to rezone and subdivide nine of the 15 subject properties, which include those located at 1435, 1445, and 1455 Argyle Street, as well as those located at 3475, 3485, 3490, 3495, 3501, and 3505 Highland Drive. This would facilitate a 65 lot single family subdivision and protection of the surrounding environmentally sensitive areas. And this would include zones from RS7, small village single family, RS8, large village single family, and P5, special park. Staff are recommending that council give second and third readings to bylaws numbers 4736 and 4737, 2017. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. There's no registered speakers. Oh, sorry. Oh, Councillor Marsden. Thank you. Uh, just to clarify through the chair to Mr. Jackson, um, the minimum lot size, we can go back to that slide, 3660? Yeah. Is that, by the map, appears to be those fronting Argyle Street. Is that correct? Yes, through the chair. That is the ones that are fronting Argyle as well. Um, this map doesn't show it quite as clearly, but where that sort of curve is between the two different colors, the darker orange and the sort of lighter yellowy orange, yeah. there'd be a new proposed cul-de-sac heading northwest off of Highland. The lower portion of that cul-de-sac on the west side, uh, there we go, would include some RS7 lots as well, which would be the same minimum lot size of 340 meters squared. And it, would that be consistent with the with the lots that are on the west side of Argyle currently? Would they be the RS7s as well? That Actually, the lots on the uh, west side of Argyle are currently uh, RS8, which is the large village single family lot, which is a minimum lot size of 400 meters squared or approximately 4,300 square feet. The lots that share a common lane with the lots on Argyle um, facing the next street over are actually the RS7s. Okay, so they're What's being proposed is roughly 700 square feet smaller than what's on the street right now. Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. I have no registered speakers. Is there anybody here who'd like to speak to this item? Anyone to speak to this item? Third and final time. Any speakers to this item? Seeing no speakers, I declare this item closed. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, that's the final item on this agenda. Okay. Um, motion to adjourn by Councillor Reed. Okay. I declare, oh, and the, the public hearing is now closed. Yes, thank you.